Good morning and welcome to today's committee hearing on school food. I'm Rita Joseph, Chair of Education Committee. Today we are having a hybrid hearing with council members and some witnesses in person. While others will be testifying remotely via Zoom, we ask for your patience as we navigate this new environment. We're here today to talk about school foods because there's nothing more important than the health and well-being of New York City's more than one million school children. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, most children in the United States get as much as half of their daily calories at school. That makes school food an essential part of students' nutrition and health, as well as important tools in combating childhood hunger. Hunger has always been a critical issue in New York City, but it's become even worse since COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, one in five New York City children were experiencing food insecurity. But since the pandemic, the proportion of food proportion of food insecure children have grown from one in four. We also know that healthy eating in childhood and adolescence is important for proper growth, development, and to prevent obesity and various other health conditions, including diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease, among others. Additionally, in order to succeed in the classroom, every student needs nutritious food in order to live a healthy life and be their best at each school day. As a classroom teacher for over 20 years, I know how important school food programs are for students. Hungry children cannot pay attention, concentrate, or participate effectively in class. That's why I'm such a huge supporter of the Breakfast in the Classroom program, which provides students with breakfast in a bag to eat in the classroom after the start of the school day. Most students are not able to get to school early in the morning before school starts to have a sit-down meal in the cafeteria. Breakfast in the classroom allows them to sleep later and get both rest and food they need to stay alert and focused in school. It also results in improved behavior and fewer fights among students. The Department of Education Office of Food and Nutrition Services, known as OFNS, offer free breakfast, lunch, and after-school meals to all New York City public school students during the school year. Each summer, OFNS also provides free meals at hundreds of sites across the city. Include, including designated public schools, community pools, centers, parks, and food trucks. In recent years, DOE's school, food meal, DOE's school meal programs have gone a number of changes, such as phasing out unhealthy lunch, breakfast items, containing dangerously high risk of sodium, fat, and preservatives. And DOE says their nutrition standard now exceed USDA standards. For school meals, DOE has also established meatless Mondays with all vegetarian breakfast and lunch menus, expanded efforts to use more locally grown produce, and installed, installed salad bars in many school buildings to provide access to more fresh vegetables and fruits. In addition to breakfast in the classroom, DOE has other new programs like garden to cafe schools, which let students grow and harvest food at community gardens and actually eat what they have grown. A few years ago, DOE initiated a scratch cooking food cook scratch cooking pilot which installed professionally trained chef at several book Bronx schools to develop scratch cooked meals during a fresh using fresh ingredients to move away from highly processed foods. The DOE also launched a cafe cafeteria redesign initiative for high schools to transform them into food court type setting that provides a more welcoming environment, more daily menu options and faster service. Students obviously like it, as high schools with redesigned cafeterias experience a 35% increase in student participation in school meals. But we've heard that only 44 cafeterias across the city have transformed to date. Food and nutrition education programs are also critical because they provide children with knowledge to, to make healthy food choices and adopt lifelong healthy habits. I have first-hand experience with nutrition education program called Cook Shop Classroom. Every Friday, I'd conduct interactive lessons and hands-on activities with students, and they would be so engaged and excited and really look forward to participating. There's also Cook Shop Family Component. I work with parents so they can they could learn more about food and nutrition and cook meals with their kids at home. Unfortunately, many schools don't have and have and nutrition education programs like Cook Shop. And even those that do not are unable to provide enough hours of instruction. Bottom line is we want all our children to have access to fresh, nutritious, healthy food that also, that's also appealing and tastes good. So they'll actually eat it and not throw it in the trash. We know that efforts like scratch cooking, salad bars, garden to cafe, and vegetarian options are effective in providing more fresh, whole, healthy food in students. Diets, and we know that universal free school meals 
breakfast in the classroom, and cafeteria redesign actually work to get more students to participate in school meal programs. We know that food and nutrition programs like Cookshop empower students to make healthier choices. By introducing all of these initiatives, it's clear that OFNS really cares about providing nutritious school meals, but we also know that more can and must be done to get us to the goal of providing all our children with fresh, nutritious, healthy food so they'll grow up and live long, healthy lives. At today's hearing, the committee hopes to learn more from DOE about the efforts to improve school foods program and increase the number of students participating. We'd also like to hear details about plans to expand ex existing successful school food programs as well as any new initiatives in the works. In addition, we know that the pandemic and school closures caused major disruptions to school food programs and would like to learn more about the challenges it presented to OFNS and any remaining impacts on school food operations. We also hope to hear recommendations for improvements from ad advocates and other stakeholders. I wanna thank everyone who's testifying today. I wanna thank the city council staff for all the work they put in today, Giant Atwell, Masis Skalkin, and Frank Perez. I also wanna thank my staff, Sam Weinberger and Connor Urban. I'd like to remind everyone who wished to testify in person today that you must fill out a witness slip, which is located at the desk at the Sergeant at Arms near the entrance of this room. To allow as many people as possible to testify, testimony will be limited to three minutes per person, whether you're testifying on Zoom or in person. I'm also going to ask my colleague to limit the questions, comments to five minutes. Now, without any further, I'd like to first turn to the first witness panel. Of course, and I also would like to acknowledge my colleagues, Council Member Carmen De La Rosa, Council Member Shahana Hanif, Council Member Julie Menon, Council Member DeAgrick Denowitz, and Council Member Mercedes Narcisse. Jan will administer the oath to Chris Tricario, Tri sorry if I mispronounced, and Kevin Moran. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these? before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. Tr Mr. Tricarico. Tr Mr. Moran. Thank you. You may begin your testimony. Good morning, Chair Joseph and members of the Education Committee. My name is Christopher Tricarico and I am the Senior Executive Director of the Department of Education's Office of Food and Nutrition Services. Joining me today is Kevin Moran, Chief School Operations Officer for the Florida Department of Education. Thank you for inviting us to discuss the DOE's school food program. To begin, I want to emphasize that Mayor Adams and Chancellor Banks are committed to ensuring every student has equal access to quality, nutritious meals to help them succeed in and out of school. The Chancellor has set forth an ambitious vision to transform our school system that encompasses four pillars. One, reimagining the student experience. Two, scaling, sustaining, and restoring what works. Three, prioritizing wellness. Four, engaging families to be our true partners. Those pillars are at the heart of our school food program and are reflected in these priorities. Providing meals that are both delicious and adhere to high nutritional standards, transforming our students' dining experience, incorporating community engagement and student feedback to improve our menus, promoting equity across the system. I would like to personally thank the council for its longstanding commitment to ensuring that students have access to healthy meals, as well as successfully advocating for universal free lunch, breakfast in the classroom, and funding the first year of our halal and kosher meals pilot programs. We look forward to our continued collaboration. I would also like to thank the school food advocates who we, we closely work with and who are great partners to us. We are proud of the innovative work carried out by our over 8,000 dedicated employees in 1,300 kitchens. We serve more than 800,000 meals per day to students attending over 2,000 schools, including charters and non-public schools. All meals adhere to a rigorous nutritional and health standards from the New York City Department of Health and go beyond the USDA National School Lunch Program standards. Our free breakfast, lunch, and after-school meals offer delicious, healthy options that appeal to students of all ages and diverse backgrounds. Each day, our school food service workers prepare free breakfast, which can include fruits, yogurts, bagels, cereals, and more, available to every student to help ensure that they start the day with a healthy and nutritious meal. Further, we are proud to offer universal free lunch, ensuring every student has access to high-quality meals throughout the day. 
all of our ingredients adhere to strict standards regarding sodium, fat, sugar, and calories to ensure healthy meals for our students. For example, we only purchase antibiotic-free chicken tenders with sodium not exceeding 480 milligrams, saturated fat under 10% of total calories, and breading containing at least 51% whole grain. We also feature whole fresh fruit and fresh vegetables, which about 20% come from New York State. We have made a lot of progress over the years in creating delici delicious, healthy, culturally responsive, positive dining experiences for our students, and we are always looking for ways to improve. In addition to nutrition, the Department of Education is laser focused on equity. Our citywide menus include two meatless days, 100% antibiotic free chicken, scratch recipes, and fresh vegetables and fruits with every serving. The menus are available in nine languages, posted on our website, accessible through our school food app, and are carefully planned by our team of professional chefs. These menus are identical in all districts. Beginning this fall, our new cook ambassadors, one in every district, will make certain cooks are continually trained in recipe execution, ensuring all menu items are made uniformly. Cook ambassadors will also be trained in scratch cooking techniques, food safety, and customer service. Furthermore, the Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity, TREE, neighborhoods are prioritized when selecting schools for new programs. These neighborhoods are defined as the most impacted by COVID-19, in addition to communities that have a high percentage of other health and socioeconomic disparities. All upcoming cafeteria enhancement experience sites and summer meal sites prioritize these TREE neighborhoods. CEE is a renovation of the service line that allows more daily choices for students, as well as, as, well as updated furniture and artwork created by students from each school. We are in the process of completing 40 more CEE during this capital plan. We also plan to renovate all middle and high school cafeteria service lines and are excited that 50 million was just added to the capital budget for these renovations. We are also proud of the work we have done in over 60 halal sites since the council pilot in 2019. All of these sites now have certified kitchens and staff that serve approved halal meals. We partner with the moms from across the city to support the initiative and are in the process of certifying 15 more sites that will begin serving halal meals in September of 2022. Any schools interested in becoming a halal certified site should engage their school community and reach out to my office. The Chancellor's prioritization of community engagement has renewed our focus on incorporating feedback, which is the foundation of our school meals program. To this end, we have embarked on an extensive community engagement plan in which OFNS representatives attend all community education council meetings. The OFNS representatives provide a brief overview of our school meals program, then answer questions and gather feedback that is synthesized and becomes the basis of a decision making around menus. This engagement will continue in the fall when OFNS will join CEC, parent teacher association, school leadership team, and other community based meetings. In addition, Starting in September, we once again will be meeting regularly with student ambassadors and student councils to hear directly from them. Student taste testings, which have been taking place all year long, will continue in the fall as we work through new recipes and menu items. Turning to our summer meals program, we look forward to offering free breakfast and lunch to anyone 18 years old and younger across the city during July and August. Our priority is to be flexible in addressing the needs of particular communities, and we are committed to expanding our reach and adding as many sites as possible. To this end, we are accepting applications for summer meal sites throughout June as NYCHA and Parks Department continue to hire seasonal staff throughout the month. Finally, I want to recognize our amazing school food service workers who demonstrated their ongoing commitment to communities during the darkest days of the pandemic. In a Herculean effort, we transformed our school operation to provide delicious, nutritious meals to the entire city. From May 2020 to August 2021, our food service workers prepared and served over 100 million meals, providing three meals a day to anyone who needed them, children and adults alike. We are incredibly proud of the work that they did. In conclusion, I want to reiterate my gratitude to our close partnership with Mayor Adams' office and the City Council. Students need to feel healthy and well-nourished to thrive at school and beyond. Thanks to the hard work of our food service workers, we strive to make this a reality every single day across this great city. We look forward to continuing this work together to ensure the health and well-being of all our children. Thank you, and we are happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Um, is, are you, is Kevin?
Kevin, are you testifying as well? No, she's just here for the support. Um, I'd like to recognize um, Council Member Linda Lee. Thank you for being here. All right, let's get to the questions. At the onset of COVID-19 pandemic in March of 2020, DOE was forced to close schools. Buildings and transition to remote learning and the Office of Food and Nutrition Services pivoted to a grab and go service model, offering free breakfast, lunch to all students and to the general public at roughly 500 school buildings across the city. In the fall of 2020, schools reopened to a blended learning model which called for a combination of remote and in-person instruction. This meant that OFNS had to operate hybrid models serving meals in schools to students in attendance while continuing to provide grab and go service for remote students as well. Did OFSN have to hire additional staff to meet the demand of this hybrid service model in each school? If so, what was the new staff retained when school was fully reopened and hybrid service was discontinued? Since the onset of COVID-19, has OFSN experienced any staffing issues related to the pandemic? My voice is loud enough, but during the pandemic, um, we did not hire many stu uh, new staff members. Um, we lost several staff members during the pandemic, but we were able to function and serve the hybrid model with the staff that we had. Uh, since um, early September of 2021, we have been hiring staff to make sure we cover all of the vacancies that we have. Um, at the moment, we are almost back to the uh, pre-pandemic levels of staff and have not missed any work that was needed in all of the schools. Okay. Um, as you remember, um, in September, of 20, September 13, 2021, marked the full term of in-person attendance for all students, teachers, staff. Can you share with us what the average daily number of meals served between the start of the pandemic and the average daily meals served now? Has there been a reduction or increase in the number of meals served post-pandemic? If so, what do you attribute the change to? Um, the average daily attendance in the city did decrease when we returned after the pandemic, uh, after the school closures. Um, we are currently serving an estimated number of meals around 800,000 meals per day. That includes breakfast, lunch, snack, and supper. Um, that is definitely lower from what we were doing pre-pandemic, but that also takes into consideration the less number of students that are attending New York City schools. Okay, and that was because of that, okay. Um, what if residual pandemic effort, effects, ha, um, effects have impacted school meal programs since school resumed full in-person instruction? For example, have there been pandemic-related supply chain issues? If so, how have they affected your operations? I'm very proud to say that my office, from the start of the pandemic, decided to increase as many of our options that we have in our product basket. We did have specific supply chain issues, but it never, prevent, it, it never prevented us from serving a reimbursable, healthy, nutritious, delicious meal to all the students that we were serving. And, and, and for now, everything is back to normal, running on, on, on time, on schedule, and, and the needs of the students are being met. Every single day, Chair. Due to school closure transition to remote instruction in early in the pandemic, a federal program, the Coronavirus Pandemic EBT card, was created to cover meal expense for students who typically receive free meal when the schools but were re learning remotely due to the pandemic. Because New York City is a universal free lunch district, all public school students are eligible to receive this PEBT, regardless of their household income, immigration status. The benefits were retroactive to March 2020 and were loaded on um, EBT cards that were distributed by mails. Families are due to receive their third round of food benefits in the amount of $375 per child in June of 2020. Does OFSN has any information about the, P uh, the EBT program and whether all New York City public schools families receive it? Do you have any idea of how much funds for the city families were spent? Uh, the PEBT program is not run by the New York City Department of Education, but we do have the attendance records and the actual enrollment that we submit to the state to make sure all children who are in, in our system, in our school food authority, get the PEBT money. Do you have any idea how much of the funds for the silly families were spent? Do you know? Say that again? The, the funds that were spent on the families, do you know how much? Do you uh, have an at idea? At current time, I don't have that, but I can get that answer and come back to you. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, 
the, at the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, I remember Congress passing the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which include child nutrition and the COVID-19 waivers that allowed all students, regardless of financial status, to eat breakfast, lunch at school for free. It also provided additional funding to schools to offset higher food and labor costs and flexibility to meeting changes needs due to supply chain disruption and school closures. However, all of these waivers are due to expire on June 30th, 2022. <clears throat> One, what are the impact does the expiration of child nutrition waivers have on summer meals for the summer of 2022? What impact does the expiration of child nutrition waivers have on school meals operation for school 2022-2023? And how will the supply chain challenges impact DOE's ability to meet federal meal patterns requirement? Did the waiver make it easier to provide meals in the face of the supply chain challenges? I'm going to take one at a time. One at a time. <laughs> yes, please do. Um, the, yes, the waivers do expire on June 30th, so starting for the first time in two years, this summer, we will return to pre-pandemic rules and regulations around the summer meals program. What that means for students is they must eat meals inside of the cafeteria and any park or pool or any other area like that, they must eat within a designated area. They will no longer be allowed to take meals off site, which they were allowed during the pandemic. That is one waiver that expires. Okay. During the school year, the new school year coming up, since we no longer are under the waivers, we will lose an approximate 15% of the reimbursement per meal due to the summer and pandemic waivers expiring. Um, supply chain challenges, once again, we do not have supply chain challenges. We are able to provide every single day three nutritious meals as needed that meet the reimbursable program that are healthy, nutritious, and delicious. I think I covered them all or I missed that last one? Yeah, one more. <laughs> we had one more. Um, the, the, are you, your abilities to meet the federal meal pattern requirements, the meal pattern requirements by the federal government? Yeah, we always will meet the meal pattern requirements by the federal government with every meal that we do. Going back to what I said earlier, we make sure our product inventory basket is well stocked. And any time we may run out of something, which happens rarely, we always have a backup option that is served. Schools know this. Schools have it on their menu. And we also have alternative options on our menu every single day. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to recognize Councilmember Lewis. Good morning. Good morning, Councilmember Alexa. Good morning, Councilmember Shaker. Um, I will open the floor now to my colleagues for questioning. <clears throat> Sir Dino hmm? Dinowitz, and then after Councilmember Lee. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I, I want to start by saying I'm very pleased to hear that um, there are 60 halal sites, uh, certified sites, and the work that you're doing to provide more certifications uh, at more schools. Um, and I look forward to reaching out to you about, about that uh, for certain. Um, so one of the phrases uh, you're using is nutritious and delicious. Do, do you eat the school lunch? I have been eating school lunch ever since I'm four years old. Not oh, only good. am I in this position now, I was a principal previous to this, a teacher and a student in all New York City schools, including the fact that my mother worked in the school food office and my school when I was in Martin Van Buren High School in Queens. Love to hear it. I'm wondering, uh, because I, 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 I didn't, I think we weren't allowed to, by the way, as teachers we weren't allowed to, which is, I guess, good because it's for the kids. Teachers are allowed if you purchase meals. Oh, yeah, no thanks. But, <laughs> but you know, I, the students would come up with their breakfast and it, you, everything that you're saying was on the plate. They had the fruit, the, and they would just eat the cereal. They'd come up with their lunch, looks like a nice plate, and they would just eat the french fries. And so I'm wondering what survey data, ex I'm assuming you asked the kids how they feel about the, uh, the food. Part of it's cultural competency, but part of it is just hey, what changes can we make to make sure you, as a student, are, are able to make those healthy choices? Because we're not sure about that delicious part. So what survey data exists um, to see if the, the students are actually eating the food and, and enjoy the food? So a couple of things, if you don't mind. I just want to make some clarifications. Sure. Um, the USDA program that we are in, New York City School Food Authority, mandates that we always serve three components. We offer up to five components, including offering milk. So students must take at least three components 
I, I get, don't mean to, time's ticking. I know they take it. I'm saying they don't need it. So what we do <laughs> that's is what we, That's what I'm asking, yeah. what the survey data is and how you're responsive to the, to the desires of our students. That's what I'm asking. We test all our products that go on the plate in front of students. So every single item that goes on a tray is approved by a student panel, whether it's in the past or any upcoming items in the future. We do our best to talk to students about what they like, but we always have to do two things. Do what they need, do what they like, and follow the USDA regulation. And is, are those panels, are those like public panels? Is that available online? And as, as you recognize each individual school community is different, uh, you, we spoke about halal food, which is great, but there's also uh, other cultural differences depending on the community. Do you take the needs of each individual school or area into consideration with your student panels? All our cooks are trained, actually, to make sure that they're addressing any needs of the community, the school's com community specifically. We meet with students at schools. We meet with students who are on panels at schools, plus taste testing. Taste testing is available at every school. All a school has to do is ask for it. We will then come to the school or bring children to headquarters where our test kitchen is. But going back to the individual communities, if the cooks know their communities, which they are trained on, they are allowed to alter the recipe with seasoning as long as that does not change the nutritional value of the recipe to meet the needs of that community. But I do want to stress the menus are citywide. We look to make sure that the plate that is served in the Bronx is served in Staten Island and served in Queens and Manhattan. And I missed a borough there, but I'm sure I'll get to it eventually. No, you Brooklyn, could. Sorry. Thank you. Hey, that's a, you, could, you could exclude him. It's okay. Uh, I'm making people mad. That's fine with me. I was a principal in Brooklyn. <laughs> So it's, it's there. Um, have you, I, I, I do want to talk further, maybe I'll email the questions, but I, I would like to know the, the considerations about understanding that, that, that there's more than seasoning uh, that goes into um, the cultural differences in food choices. I, I want to ask uh, one other question, it's related to the garden to cafe program. You know I was going to ask about school gardens. Um, you know, it, it, because it's not just the existence of food, as you understand, it's the students' relationship with food. And of course, growing the food uh, themselves develops a positive relationship with healthy, nutritious, and delicious food. Um, so I, I'm just asking a few questions around gardens and how, how many school gardens exist, not, not relationships with, uh, with community gardens, but really on the school campuses, how many school gardens exist, I, I, um, how many are there plans for expansion of existing gardens or to expand uh, more, uh, to provide more school gardens in existing schools? And are there efforts underway to ensure that school gardens or space for new school gardens is included uh, in all new construction? Yeah, so thank you very much for the question. Uh, the Division of Operations does have an Office of Sustainability within the division. And we right now currently have 952 garden spaces across the city. That is inclusive of indoor settings in uh, aquaponics or uh, uh, other opportunities within the classroom. Um, we do have outdoor options. That is, sometimes there's access to a rooftop garden. Sometimes there's access to a greenhouse on campus, like a larger space, like a Canarsie High School, for example. Um, we also have raised planter beds. Um, you are aware of the space we have uh, at Walton and other places. So uh, we definitely want to expand. Uh, we partner with Grow NYC and other partners. We certainly expand our reach with uh, efforts through Resway Grants, through the Council's efforts. So where there's interest there, we'd like to cultivate that as well. Um, so yes, we definitely have an opportunity now to expand and do more. Um, new school construction does include some features. Um, most notably, there's one uh, that most people are familiar with, the Kathleen Grimm School at Sandy Ground, that does have rooftop access that was built as a net zero school, which is really a highlight in our, in our kind of portfolio that it is uh, solar and geothermal and redu reduction of greenhouse gases with a focus on actually having gardens on campus and on the rooftop. So yes, we, want, we are committed to that effort and we will expand. I'd love to meet with you and your team or any of those that are interested in expanding more. Um, but at current, it's 952 sites across the city. And is, it's, is there additional investment made Yes. For the Ca next fiscal year that to Well, to the council this. does provide $150,000 for small school grants to start small, $5,000 grants to start seeding the program, quite literally. Um, and so we'll look to, to you to, to continue the conversation about additional opportunities, sp site-specific, beyond the, the original groupings. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'd like to recognize um, Council Member Brewer, Council Member Villas, Council Member Guterres, and Council Member Breu, and Krishna.
Thank you. Next question, Council Member Lee. Sorry, without the Zoom hand function, I don't know what the order is. So I'm getting, I'm, try, I'm trying to get used it. to this. Now I'm trying to get used to the in-person. Okay, um, really quick question on um, the vendors that you utilize in the contracting process. So just out of curiosity, how many vendors do you currently contract to for the school meals? So we currently have three main distributors that purchase and deliver food to our schools, plus a lot of contract direct relationships where we have the relationship with the vendor and they also deliver food to our schools. Um, the exact number of all the vendors does change based on the number of contracts that we have, contracts that are expiring and contracts that are coming up. I can definitely follow up with the specific number, but going back to the original, three main distributors that we use to purchase and deliver food that all must meet our regulations and standards. Okay, and then how often are those contracts evaluated? So is it like five years, three years, and then what's the RFP process? Can other folks get into that system? How does that work? Excellent question. Yes, it's every five years. Um, it's expiring at the end of 2024, and we're gonna go through the process once again to go out and bid these massive, great contracts. Okay, and are you also, and this is connecting to the culturally competent meals, so are, is there room, I guess, if you're in charge of the RFP process, can we add some kind of stipulation or sentence in there awarding contracts to folks that do serve culturally diverse meals? Because, I, I, you know, and it's, it gets tricky because I understand there's economies of scale, right? Um, because we're talking about a million students in the school system, but then how do we make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're working with vendors that can actually cook the food in the way that folks are familiar or, or prefer? Excellent question, and this chancellor is prioritizing that, and we, as we write all new contracts, are putting in language like that, including language around WMBE, as well as local purchasing language in there as well. Okay, um, and then one quick question, and I don't know if this, is, this was gonna be one of your questions, Chair Joseph, so I hope I'm not stealing one, but um, in terms of the construction and the redesign of the cafeterias, because like, one of the things we did was, um, you know, we're providing, we have, we have very little capital dollars from all of our pots, but, you know, the air conditioning for the staff that work in the kitchen is extremely important. Um, and so, you know, I think some of the redesign, and also in terms of the redesign of the kitchens, it costs about 500000 from my understanding. It only takes about a weekend, which seems very doable. And so how do we make sure that, you know, you know, how, how is the DOE and the administration working on that aspect of the construction to make sure that um, those are happening in each of our districts? What's the process? How do we access that money or request that money? Because I have 35 public schools that I need to, you know, redesign. So if you could yep. speak thank, a little bit. Thank you for that question. This capital plan, we're actually in the process of doing 40 more cafeteria enhancement experiences. Just so everyone understands, that is a redesign of the cafeteria service line and where the children eat the food, as well as the cafeteria artwork that goes up. It is not a renovation of the kitchen. But we currently are looking to make sure we're identifying these renovation in all of the tree neighborhoods, task force um, okay. neighborhoods, yeah. as well as any future plans that we have for cafeteria enhancement will go by student participation, areas of need, and areas in social economical um, situations that we would love to be able to increase participation in those schools. Okay, thank you. So if I could just build on, on Chris's comments, uh, we're, we're working in partnership with our facilities teams to make these happen with the school food team. Um, we're already up to 50 from previous plans. Uh, to Chris's point, there's like 40 uh, in the pipeline. Um, I wanna thank the chair um, and I wanna thank the council for their advocacy for additional funding. We'll more than double that in the next uh, plan and happening now to the, to the increase in funding. Now that 50 million means 100 schools that will get this cafeteria enhancement. And one of the things, lessons learned over time is we're able to learn that sometimes while you're there, it's not much to do the floor tile. It's not much to do the lighting. It's not much to get inside the kitchen and look at some of the ventilation concerns. It's that, you know, and the things that we've learned over time and how to better the process. So we're super excited about the 100 additional and we'll be partnering with you. Uh, Chris and team will make sure we're doing some local outreach that if you see a priority and say this junior high school, this high school, we want to partner there and also look for efficiencies on our operation scale and how we make things accessible and other opportunities to, to use uh, funding streams to, to better the project along. Um, the second part I heard around ventilation, I know you mentioned uh, air conditioning. For our cafeterias, uh, Chris and I talk about this regularly, um, and we currently have at least 500, uh, in excess of 500 kitchens um, that had received, had, that had functioning air conditioning. We're uh, just completed 32 since May, last May. 
um, we're adding now with additional funding, and I thank you again for this, is that we're going to chase out 411 schools in the next couple of years and get those 411. So we're closing in on 1,000. The, the remaining sites that do not have the air conditioning in the, within the kitchen, um, we're already started the overview and assessment of what that cost would be as it is a capital request for a split unit and they vary from kitchen to kitchen based upon space to roof, space to exterior where we could put condensers and such, but very much top of mind and we'll keep you regularly updated as we kind of complete these projects. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next person, Council Member Narcisse. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Um, I would have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna have to narrow it down. Um, you know food and health have a direct relation in your body, right? And um, my community, the district I represent, uh, right now we have a highest in diabetes comparing to the city, 30% comparing to the city, about 24 hypertension is killing us. So since food have a direct relation, so I wanna know, since we know the high risk area, the high risk that we've been talking about, it took the pandemic to highlight it, the problems that have burdened our community. And we cannot go backward, we have to go forward. And one of the things that we can do is making sure our children understand the relation with food and, um, and the health within their body. So my whole thing, first, be, before I get to my question, um, are the kitchen in our district are working? Because I know I visited some, they need to be done. They need to be done over, they, we need a whole makeover, and the stove not working for some of them, and some of them don't have AC, and if you don't have air conditioner, how are you gonna cook? Even it's winter time, you need um, a proper working kitchen. So having said that, since we know this pandemic has highlighted those problems for us and we know the percentage, so how is the food structure coming to our district? Are they still processing? Because I'm hearing that you have great food, but I have visited my school, I have not seen great plate of food or the tray of food. So is that a part, and I, I heard you say, it's throughout the city. We have a set of diets for everyone, right? So have you seen a decrease in, um, in the workers, the kitchen staff after post-pandemic? So definitely post-pandemic, during the height of the pandemic, we lost uh -huh. around 2,000 employees. We are now almost back up to the regular staffing levels that we were pre-pandemic. Um, I do want to reiterate that uh -huh. Meals should be uniform across the city. There are menus for the pre-K through eight, and there are menus for high school. If there are individual situations and you go visit schools, please let us know immediately. Mm -hmm. We will go, we will partner with you, we will walk through those schools to make sure we address any issues that are there. Our job is to make sure we are serving nutritious, delicious, and healthy meals at every single school. We also offer salad bars at every single school. Either it's an actual bar or we're making the actual salads, presenting them to kids, and it is actually menued twice a week on our menus, actual salad in addition to the other entree and the other components of the meal that we give. Um, very important that we continue to look at products that are lower in sodium, lower in sugar. We no longer serve juice in the morning. We make sure water is available every single day in mm -hmm. every single cafeteria. Our milk is all low fat and non-fat. We are always encouraging our con- <laughs> I was getting to that. I'm, I guess somebody jumped into it. I was getting to that too, go ahead. Lane, we, we, <laughs> we don't want chocolate milk for our children. We have to have a decrease. We're not gonna go back and forth, uh, council, council member. This mayor yes. and this chancellor yeah. has charged us with making sure we continue to improve our menus to make them healthier every single day. All of our products, we look for healthier products. We have reduced processing of foods. We have reduced processed foods, specifically processed meats on our menu. Since 2019, we only serve beef every, once every three weeks. We have two meatless days, and we have plant-powered Fridays. I do want to mention our plant-powered Fridays are primarily scratch recipes that are cooked. Fresh vegetables are roasted every single week in the schools. It should be uniform. If it is not uniform and you see something, let me know. We will personally go out together to make sure we fix all of this. Our job is to service every student equally across the city. 
I love that because I'm going to take you on for that. And if you know me, you should not promise to me because I'm going to get it. I think um, Chair Joseph can second the fact <laughs> that I will go out to a school to make sure these things are happening. Uh, okay, okay. And about staffing for the school aid, I mean, um, cafeteria. Yep, thank you very much for asking that question. Our employees are the most important thing to us and the heart of our operations. Not all heroes wear capes, some do wear aprons. We have hiring halls almost every single Saturday. We've had these hiring halls since the beginning of February. We've interviewed over 3,800 individuals that are looking to work for our organization. We have hired a good portion of that. We have obviously have a, a, a rigorous hiring process as well as our managers and cooks need to have qualifications, but we are continuing to do this until we return to pre-pandemic levels. So my time is up. Have you considered to hire locally since it'd be cultural sensitive to the area and the food as well? Hiring locally? Locally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Every single hiring hall we have, I would say 95% or more are folks from our community. Okay. Most of the folks that work in our kitchens either have children in the schools or work near those kitchens, including what I mentioned before. My mother also did it just to watch over me every single day in school. So thank you very much. My time is up. I'll come back if I have to. I'd like to recognize um, Council Member Ressler. Thank you. Um, next person, common, um, Council Member De La Rosa. Thank you. I want to just piggyback on the comments my colleagues have made about the uh, kitchens. Uh, I think it's important. We've heard from uh, union members and, and uh, workers about the, uh, the real risk to their health um, with overheated kitchens. And so just want to make sure that you know that that's a top priority for this council. Um, and I want to ask a question about inequities. Um, I've been visiting the schools in my district. Some of these buildings are 100 years old, right, which I know it's a problem. But there are some schools that you go and they have a full kitchen where they can actually cook. And then there's uh, school buildings where they can only heat up food, right? I think that um, as we look to invest in our school buildings, we need to address those inequities because if we know everything that we know about food, which is that most kids get their calories from school. I have an eight-year-old, she's always hungry. Uh, she it goes to school at eight o'clock in the morning and she's there till five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so they need to have the adequate equipment to be able to actually prepare nutritious food. So how, what is the plan for dealing with some of those inequities? Thank you for that question, and I'm, I'm glad you recognize that, and it's very important that we continue to have these conversations about the really older buildings or the smaller kitchens and see what the future holds for that. So I appreciate the question, um, and you do point out we have varying ages of our structures. Uh, my three kids went to an elementary school that was uh, over 100 years old. They're junior high school, um, 60 years old, um, and so know that there's varying space challenges. Um, we would like to see meet the schools where they are, see what's available. Um, we just redid a cafeteria Brownsville collaborative um, where we started moving the furniture, the, if you will, the chillers and the boxes, the refrigerators within the space and actually taking an adjacent space to create more space for the kitchen mm -hmm. and the workers. And so I think the older designs do limit our ability to have a full functioning kitchen. Certainly new designs and scopes with the school construction authority allow for such expansion. Um, but I'd like to, if there's a site specific that you want to go to, we'd love to partner on solutioning in real time because sometimes there is space with our Office of Space Management team um, to figure out other spaces where we can move things to, to create more space, so to speak. So we'll look forward to, but we acknowledge that is an issue with the older buildings and we'd like to partner on solutions. Great. Just to echo briefly, um, having this conversation and having and hearing about things that you see is really important for us to be able to know, address. Um, so never feel that you can't call us up, email us and ask us questions or ask us to visit a school where you have concerns. Okay. I know you y'all don't know me very well, but I'm never shy to call. Um, I will say that one of the things I'm concerned about is um, the hours for lunch. Um, my child, again, you know, they have lunch at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, they already have breakfast at home and then lunch at 10 o'clock in the morning. The school day ends at 5. What are we doing to look at? And, you know, this is not passing blames at all at the administrators of the school because clearly they're doing the best they can with having to keep up with pandemic restrictions, having to make sure the kids are spread out. Um, but what, what can we do to uh, fix this a little bit or tweak uh, the space so that more kids can have lunch at lunchtime? So I think there's two things in that question. One, the, the amount of space where children eat lunch, back to what 
my boss was saying, Kevin, about expanding those conversations and talking about the renovations. But also, as a former principal, I had three lunch periods. Each lunch period was 50 minutes, and I had two grades in that lunch period. One grade would go outside or go into the auditorium while the other grade eat, and I have to switch after that. We need to be very creative and continue these conversations with principals. And I think during the pandemic, we had to stretch out those lunch periods because of social distancing. We are really excited that come September, we're returning to pre-pandemic services where we will go back into the cafeteria, we'll go back into all the other areas where students were going to hopefully reduce some of those issues that you're mentioning. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carmen De La Rosa. I mean, Councilmember De La Rosa. Councilmember Lewis. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I have a um, three-part question. One is on cafeteria redesign and the infrastructure implementation component, vegan options, and MWBE. All right, so the first one is in regards, and this was mentioned by my colleagues already, but regarding the cafeteria redesign um, initiative, I wanted to know, does that include the infrastructure for the cooking area for our cafeteria workers that you all discussed here and some of the members brought up earlier? That's the part one question, but there's a part B to that. We, all of us advocated for capital funds for cooking kitchens, cafeterias for our schools. Is that gonna be part of the cafeteria redesign component and initiative that you mentioned today? Because if you could get that done in a weekend, and we, we already implemented the funding, can we get that done by the summer, or by the end of the summer? So that's the first question. The second question is in regards to summarizing. So I saw on here grab and go, but I wanted to know would there be vegan options for summarizing, uh, students participating in summarizing, and are you all thinking about MWBE vendors for the vegan options? that we're trying to implement. So Vegan Fridays, I love the idea. I think our mayor is amazing. I think the vendor sucked. And the kids complained. The food wasn't good. Some of it wasn't even vegan. So I wanted to know what, what, what does that look like moving forward for your agency and how could we be helpful in that area? Thank you, that's all my questions. Thank you for those questions, all great questions. Um, the cafeteria enhancement experience is only the cafeteria service line and the actual cafeteria where the children sit. It does not include any infrastructure work that needs to be done in the kitchen. It doesn't mean that we realize that some of that work does need to be completed and renovated, as, my, as Kevin mentioned, about these older aging buildings. Um, what we do in a weekend is we replace the service line with new equipment, new self-service equipment, new tables, and we partner with students to create what that atmosphere will look like, including uh, artwork that's on the wall. So it does not include kitchen infrastructure. Two, summarizing. Our menus are always meatless on Monday and plant-powered on Friday. Combination of two questions. Our Friday main entree is a scratched, cooked, plant-powered, vegan option. There are always other option, vegetarian options, available on Friday for students that may not want that individual vegan item that is plant-powered. So I know you said that not all options are vegan, because they're not. We always allow students to have that option, but our main center of the plate option will always be that plant-powered vegan option. We always want to give students choices to be able to make some decisions for themselves or at least talk to their parents about those decisions. We communicated that, but I think I, we, my team, the department needs to do a little bit better job on the menu next year in September, and you will see that clearly pointed out in the menu so there is no confusion around the options that are there. But I do want to reiterate, every day there are alternative options. On Mondays that are meatless, there are meatless alternative options for students to take, not just the main option that's there. And on Friday, there are a whole bunch of different options on our menu, bottom right box in blue, white font. You'll see all of the actual options that are available. One of our stars is this chickpea Mediterranean wrap. That is a vegan entree. That is absolutely delicious. You sound like you like that one a lot. It sounds like you like that one a lot, so I hope you're enjoying it. Yeah, yes, that is correct. And how, how can we ensure everything that you just shared about Mondays and Fridays and the different options, how could your agency and the council communicate that better so that it's across the board universal that it's available? 
One, I hold myself and my team accountable to make sure that does happen in every single school on every single day we stay on menu. But it's always good to have feedback from the community, including our relationships with principals and principals in charge during summer rising or the public feeding sites. We rely on eyes and ears throughout the entire school. And as mentioned earlier, the more feedback we get, the better it is. We are as transparent as possible. Our menus are public on the website for a reason. If someone sees something that is not on the menu, I need it to be told to my office. But there are situations and circumstances where supply chain or other things may happen. We may get shorted from a vendor, et cetera, but we will always address it. The MWBE conversation, that, is that language is written into every single contract that we write. And we look for that option as well as the local option and all future contracts that we are going into. Councilmember Menon. Thank you, Chair Joseph. So I have a number of questions. Uh, for the summer meal programs, given that it's starting on June 28th, have you all sent out notice? And in how many languages are you sending notice out? And what is the form of the notice? Thank you very much for asking that question. Um, as per the City Council law, we are required to post all the summer locations by June 1st. That was posted by May 27th. In addition to that, we are actually sending home a letter. Each principal has a letter that will be backpacked to students at, before the last day of school by the 20th in this envelope. And in this envelope, it actually has the nine languages that are translated for folks to find the summer sites. The letter also says the three closest sites, if their, if their building is not open, will be listed here for parents to go ahead and find that. But we always encourage folks to look on our website, on our webpage, the summer lookup tool that will give the most accurate data for the number of sites that are closest in that zip code. Okay. Um, one question on procurement. Why does the DOE policy require distributors to directly purchase a department's food but DOE, as I understand it, is choosing the food product. So my concern is that it's really, as the controller's 2021 report indicates, it's cutting down on both competition and it's really creating an issue regarding transparency. Great question. We, we create the spec of the type of food we want based on the USDA requirements and the New York City Department of Health requirements. Yes, we have three main distributors, and that contract goes until the end of 2024, but in the past three years, we have prioritized contract direct relationships, which answered a lot of the controller's concerns in that investigation. We want to go more contract direct, but we always have to keep a safety net to make sure we have the availability of food, to make sure we never miss a meal. We always have the supply, we always have the inventory, and we always have an, an intense, large product basket to make sure we meet the reimbursable national program standards every single day. So do you feel that you have answered the controller's concerns adequately? 100%. That, that, that letter was written and the investigation was done, I believe, towards the end of 1718. Ever since then, we have been working on all of the things that were identified because we were part of that conversation to make sure we are moving in the right direction as a department and a city. Okay. Uh, it would, I think it would be helpful if I could ask the Chair if we could get information on that to the committee because I think it, the controller raised some really important issues, so it would be great to have that data. would love to. Um, for the Scratch Cooking Pilot Program, are you going to be expanding it and into what neighborhoods if you are? Great question and has come up in, in multiple conversations. Currently and since the pilot, we have two main sites in the Bronx. Um, one at Morris Campus, which has multiple schools in it, and another at 218 in the Bronx. Um, we quickly learned that not all kitchens, because of the size and infrastructure, can do scratch cooking from the beginning. What we did learn from those two sites is that we could create recipes and use those two sites in the Bronx as test kitchens to be able to create recipes and have them on every menu in every school. We actually have scratch recipes that were created at those two sites that are on the menu every single day. We have several options, including the options that are on Plant Powered Fridays. Some of our roasted vegetable recipes, some of our pasta recipes are actually created at the Scratch Kitchen and then put on our menus citywide. Um, at the moment, we don't have any plans to expand infrastructure, but we continue to have plans to expand Scratch recipes across all schools and in, on every menu in the city. Okay. The number of food insecure children in the city, as you know, is one in four. So what are the administration's overall plans to address food insecurity? 
I think the most important part to answer that question is to continue to promote our menus, talk about our menus, talk to school communities, engage the school communities, engage stakeholders about what we do and what we provide in schools to make sure all parents, children are aware of the free meals that we offer for breakfast, lunch, snack, and dinner. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Abreu. Thank you, Chair Joseph. So I actually wanna revisit the part of excessive heating and the lack of air conditioning. Um, as you know, that has a huge impact on the preparation of food, but also causes unhealthy work conditions for school food workers. Uh, how many school kitchens currently lack air conditioning? A couple of things that I'm gonna ask Kevin to jump in here as well. The, the, the health and well-being of our workers is the most important thing. Do you have a number? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, currently, as Kevin mentioned, we have over 500 school kitchens that are air conditioned, but I also wanna make sure folks know that when it is hot, we do shut the ovens off. It is a policy to turn the ovens off and go to a cold menu to protect our workers. The other thing too is we ask them to move out of the kitchen to prepare meals, to make sure there's alternative space in and around the cafeteria in the kitchen to be able to do that where the ovens are not and where there is better ventilation. As far as the air conditioning question, I'm gonna ask Kevin. Yeah, so I'd, I'd start with, uh, and thank you, uh, Council Member, for the question. I'd start with the prioritization in the summer months is to target the schools that have air conditioning. Um, so in the hottest uh, stretches of the year that we're in air conditioned environments. Uh, and to Chris's point, we, we do dial back um, the, the heat generating appliances within the kitchen uh, when needed. But knowing that we're over 500 that have the air conditioning, I, I, I want to revisit uh, just uh, thanking the Council for their advocacy for the additional monies. Um, and Chancellor is very clear on making sure work environments are where they should be for our workers. Um, we very much value them, thank them every day for their service. So, so those 411 sites, we're going to get to as fast as we can. We just completed since May 32 of those. Uh, I visit uh, regularly with Chris and it really does make a difference within the kitchen spaces. Um, we do identify that there are sites that are complex, that lack windows, um, where the current ventilation could be improved but through a different system and not necessarily a, a, split, a split unit configuration that may work there, may not work elsewhere, or a window unit may work there, may not work elsewhere. So, so we're definitely gonna come back to the council and kind of pacing where we are to getting every single uh, school uh, kitchen to a place where it's comfortable. I would say we're building off the successes of the AC for All initiative where every instructional space was identified was air conditioned and thank you for the council for years of advocacy for that. Um, now moving to non-instructional spaces as, as we, we're gonna focus that next and sure, I'll get back to you. Thank you, I have three more questions. So I just wanna get through them before my time ends. And by the way, I'm a big fan of the chancellor myself. What is the average cost of installing air conditioning in a kitchen if you have that? Yeah, yeah, window units are less expensive. So you, you could have a scenario where you're looking at $5,000 for Ritter frame installation, electric and that. Um, there could be instances where you're looking at a $100,000 installation where a split unit or condenser needs to go, you know, the condenser goes on the roof or exterior of the building. You may have seen some of those. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the exterior, I prefer, but at the longer the run, the third or fourth or five story buildings, it's more expensive, cost prohibitive. So uh, that they could you would range. would say in what range? Was uh, that, yeah. The window units range at 5,000. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, what does, does DOE have plans to install air conditioning in every school kitchen? If not, why not? And if you can speak to the short term and long term plan to prevent overheated kitchens this summer. Absolutely goal setting to getting to a place where every kitchen is comfortable for all our workers. So we, we are on pace uh, uh, with identifying and evaluating every site. We'll have a report on cost and execution, um, but absolutely it is a goal of ours. And, and just for, for, to make a point, Kitchens that are historically hot, we are not using them for the summer. We want to use kitchens that have the air conditioners and we always make arrangements to try to make sure that happens. Thank you so much. I got my questions with a minute left. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Council Member. Um, I'd like to recognize Council Member Gennaro and Council Member Ong. Um, next person, Council Member Gutierrez. Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to confirm, I, when we were discussing uh, Plant Powered Fridays, did you mention that um, on Plant Powered Fridays, all meals are scratch cooked? 
the main entrees that we have that are shown on our menu for Plant Powered Fridays come from scratch recipes, yes. Okay. But there that are didn't... other options that are available mm -hmm. that are not scratch, but the main entree that is presented on the menu comes from the scratch recipe. But that doesn't imply, does that imply that then every school has that capability? Every single school that you see the menu option listed is the same across the city. So if the rice and plantain power bowl mm -hmm. is listed, it will be the same in every single school. Okay, so every school has access to scratch cooked meals. Scratch recipes, yes. Scratch recipes, okay. Um, can you share what the cost of school lunch is, what the cost to prepare it? Um, and without labor, it's around $4. Without labor, it's $4. And what do you think an increase to that, how would it impact the, the variety or the quality of school lunch of, let's say, an increase of a dollar or two per meal? Um, I think that allows us to explore other options and explore things that might be more favorable to students. Mm -hmm. um, so considering we've had an extensive conversation on feedback, um, I, I think like a lot of my colleagues have been meeting with schools, speaking with students, with even the staff, and um, I'm just curious to know, I'm aw I know that um, there's extensive testing done in research labs on school meals, and you are the DOE is really um, forward about feedback from students, um, but I still, but kids are still complaining, right? Um, they're still unwilling to eat the food. I know for a fact, like just last week, kids said like, well, they just don't eat, right? Um, it could be a myriad of reasons. I'm not blaming it entirely on the food, but what do you see as the main challenges in those areas? When you're getting feedback from kids from us here, what are some of the challenges that, that you're hearing and, and what are you all planning for the future to, to solve for that? I think some of the most important things we need to do is continue to engage stakeholders and our stakeholders here, all the school communities as well as students. We need to be in every single school. We're going to be doing that in the fall, meeting with PTAs, meeting with school leadership teams, meeting with students mm -hmm. to make sure they understand the menu. But we're also talking more to principals and school administrations to help promote our meals in the schools. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example, as principal, I had a child read the 100% attendance every single day of all the classes and talk about the menu choices. I was in District 32 in Bushwick and I wanted to make sure that the kids understood what was being served and they had knowledge of that. But also, as a principal, I went down to the lunchroom and I ate with my students. Mm -hmm. I think when we start to get more into that and we have the school administration, parents and students together and having the same conversation, we do increase participation mm -hmm. across the board. I'm yeah. very proud to say that we still are serving over 800,000 meals per day mm -hmm. and I think that's important to recognize and especially given the hard work that our folks are doing that students are actually eating the meals and enjoying the meals. Yeah. So I love that you rep your district. I represent school district 32. It's actually in one of my schools in Bushwick where I had heard from students that said that they were choosing not to eat. Some of the staff said on Fridays we just make plantains because that's the only thing the students will eat. So I appreciate what you're saying and I know, um, what, what school were you at? I was the teacher at PS 274 for about five years, so assistant cool. principal there, and in then principal district. at 75 for about 10 years. Also my district, yeah. fantastic. If you can tell me the school where you went where the kids are saying they're not eating, I'd love I'll to go visit. I'll tell you offline. I don't yeah. <laughs> um, but that, I appreciate that. Um, and I was in school actually when plantains were integrated into the school lunch and I can't tell you how, you know, that really changed the way that I approached food and so I just would love to see it more of an expansion and that's why I appreciate what you're saying um, as far as um, outreach. So my last question is related to, to summer meals um, and I think during this the pandemic this really was a game changer for our families. One of the things I really love to see was that students could pick up and go but also it was available to their caregivers to their parents as well. Um, I know that that's not something that we it looks like it's in the budget, but is this is this a concept that the DOE is looking at as a means to combat food insecurity when we're offering free meals to our students that we continue to make it available to their caregivers, their families as well? We were extremely proud and honored to be able to serve New York City children and adults alike during the pandemic. Once we returned to in-person learning, we transitioned the food public meal service to the city's robust food pantries throughout the city. We do have links on our website as well as the DSS website, which will give parents access to the food that they need. Fantastic. Um, and then my last question, it's going off a little bit of what Councilmember Menon was asking about the outreach. Um, 
the the sites you said should have been up by May 27th or they there was a spreadsheet up by May 27th and as of this morning the lookup tool is active when you go on our web page all you need to do is put your zip code in okay. and then all of the sites within that zip code will come up not just schools but pools park NYCHA's developments libraries will all be included in that okay. I do want to make sure that everyone understands we're continuing to out to do outreach to our folks and to other city agencies to continue to increase the number of sites that will be serving meals throughout the summer okay you said just today I'm sorry I know I'm over time but I, I checked this morning and it says no data available but it sounds like some of this stuff is happening yeah I checked speak. I, I don't want to disagree with you but I checked last night and I put in zip code 11017 and it all came up but I will as soon as this is over we can go yeah. on my phone okay. and take a look I appreciate it. thank you thank you council member council member Brewer thank you very much I've spent about a hundred hours with these two over the years so I appreciate the work that you're doing <coughs> Um, the issue is, um, I know you heard earlier about the cooking versus warming capacity. Um, do you have like uh, the metrics so we would know which school is which? Because one suggestion, A, it should go up on open data, my bill, of course. But second, um, I think it would help us because we get asked for bathrooms, electrical, God knows what, and we could help with the renovation of those kitchens if needed. So it would be good to have that up on a data point which is warming and which is scratch and what we can do to help. I never heard anybody ask. The, the principals don't focus on food. I'm going to be honest with you. We do, you do, so we need that. Also, um, how many schools have functioning dishwashers? How many have what I want? Are the apple cutters? I mean, I know those are silly, but what do you have that, those metrics? Dishwashers? Yeah, I don't have them in front of me, but I can definitely get them. Okay, to and then the deli, well, I call it deli style. How many schools have that, which I paid for at Brandeis? Is that something that is helpful? How many have it, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, council member that's the CE initiative actually. So the deli style service is part of the CE initiative. So that is part of our expansion and any new school that is built. I'm talking about the old schools. I don't have no damn new schools. Yeah, the I'm combination about the old of schools. both. We got the we got the 50 million to do 100 more CE Delhi style, but also new schools that are built. We're always installing. I don't those care CE. about new schools. Manhattan doesn't have too many new schools. So so the Delhi style will be going into every current school. Our plan is to do every middle school and high school, with okay. any funding that can come. And of course, we thank the council for the 50 million that's coming. And of course, we're going to love to partner with you to try to get more. Okay, so I need that data on dishwashers, warming, scratch. We have it all. Come and I want apple cutters. Nobody eats a whole apple. I've been saying that for 20 years. Understood. Okay. Thank you. I bought two, but you could buy some also. Um, the issue of, this is obviously, I'm a, as you know, a Nancy Eaton fan, big time. Wits. And the issue is, how do you support a chef coalition to design menus and provide training for school cooks? You have great, great staff, I know them. But are you out doing that kind of outreach to see if there are other coalitions that could help with some of the designing of the menus and training? Thank you very much for that. Um, we actually partner closely with WITS as well as the Coalition for Healthy School Food. Um, we now have cook ambassadors, one in every district, which comes from the model from Nancy Easton and her team. They will help train those cook ambassadors to help train the individual cooks that are in every single kitchen that we have. Okay, and then what happens with the Friday, we heard earlier um, about the, you're doing that, I'm not big on healthy food or anything, just so you know. I like fresh food. I'm telling you right now, I like fresh food. The mayor and I have had this disagreement for many years. I like fresh food. So the question is, you and I have been up to uh, Orange County. We've been to the Black Dirt Lettuce. We've been all these different places together. So my question is, what are we doing about working with Grow NYC, Cornell, et cetera? I know we have certain days, but to be honest with you, the food metrics report, which I read religiously, has indicates that the local dairy and produce to DOE has reduced a lot from 2018 to 2021. Now I know it's hard sometimes to buy locally, but to me that makes the food what it would appetizing to me and to every school child. So what are we doing about this issue that I again have been talking about for 20 years? I appreciate those concerns and we, we look to address all of those, especially now that we are coming out of the pandemic. I think during the pandemic- We didn't do it before the pandemic, Chris. I'm just saying. We are, we are looking to increase all of our local spend as well as looking to increase all fresh vegetables and salad bars. How and are we doing that? Well. I'm sorry, how are we actually trying to increase those metrics? How, so I mean, we're looking to have contracts that call out language for local vendors. 
Okay, because right now it's just could, it, it not mandated. Is there some way we can make it mandated that we purchase locally? I would love to continue this conversation with broader folks. This is 20, year, 20 years discussing this. He and I have been going back and forth. All right, the final, the, the final issue is just in terms of um, the food, and you know, you talk about training. I know you mentioned that, but how exactly does that take place in the schools, the training? How, how do you working on this uh, training program? Just can you be more specific? Yes, that's a great question. Prior to the pandemic, we brought everyone to headquarters from across the city. This was 1,600 cooks coming throughout the weeks, throughout the months to do training. We realized that during the pandemic, we need to go to the schools. So we are now training one cook ambassador, which will be the head cook in every single district, which will then go into each of the schools in the district to help train okay. the cooks that are in the schools. Okay. I could go on and on, but thank you very much. I think the feds are also not helpful in terms of some of their allocations. I know you said $4, but there was an article in the paper the other day that the feds are being challenging. Are you able to work on that? They're trying to hurt, I don't know if it's New York, but around the country in terms of cutting. We'd love to continue those conversations. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Brewer. Um, Council Member Hanif. Thank you. First, I just wanna uh, thank you for meeting with me earlier this year um, to help me better understand the halal food uh, expansion work in our schools. Um, growing up, going to public schools uh, in the city, uh, I didn't have the opportunity to um, like rejoice in the amount of food options that we have now. And I remember um, Muslim kids and I at PS230, we would need to tag team when there was pepperoni uh, on the pizza and when there were ham sandwiches and they weren't labeled. And so we had to do our best to determine which day we were almost about to eat pork um, and then to understand why that was happening. So we're at a really unique place in our city um, in recognizing what food justice means. And so um, really hats off to the advocacy that took place and particularly by Muslim families to bring about the expansion, which is now a permanent program. And so I'm really excited by the, um, the expansion. I know that you mentioned that there are um, many more schools in the process of certifying. Are you able to provide us with a list of those schools? And in particular, would love to know if PS230, where I went to school, um, what's the status with that school, and if you all are doing proactive outreach to ensure that schools know um, that this, uh, this is possible. Thank you for those questions, um, and you're welcome for that visit that you and I had over Zoom, and it was a learning experience for us as well. Um, one, I have to thank the council for just helping us create the halal and kosher pilot that we did way back then, because this would not exist if it wasn't for the partnership with the council. Um, we are now in the middle of certifying 15 additional kitchens that will be in service come September 2022. But we also are, are meeting with all community education councils, PTA, school leadership teams to get the word out about our program. And one of the other, one of the things that is a requirement for my staff when they go to meet with schools is to talk about all of the options and halal and kosher are options there to continue to get the word out. We want to make sure that the chancellor's vision about engaging stakeholders and engaging school communities stays so anytime this conversation about any option including halal comes up we want to make sure the school community has a conversation with the administration of the building and then we are contacted and we start the process from there um, we would want to get this information out as much as possible and i think we've done a great job this year in increasing the number of sites but we are open to conversations about more sites within the city and do you have anything specific about um ps230 at this moment i will get back to you I promise you. I look forward to that. And I mean, it was really great to learn that over the last decade, um, we have stopped using pork products. We no longer are providing fried foods. I think this is an interesting shift and again speaks to um, the food justice work that is so necessary at this time. <laughs> is there a curriculum about the fact that there are all of these options? Like are students learning what it means to have halal food and kosher food, vegan options, meatless Mondays. Um, is, that being, is that something that they're learning in the process of uh, their lunches? Going, um, going forward, 
We have a principal's guide that's available for all principal that talks about all of our options. We ask our staff when they're going to have these stakeholder and community engagement meetings to talk about all of those options. And one of the things we're expecting to happen after that is and, uh, the principals and the teachers talk about what's happening within the school lunchroom. But then there's a different component, which I think is the nutrition education piece which lives within the office of wellness which i know they're tapping into all of the things that we're doing within the school food kitchens so right now like in the school curriculum there isn't something built in where young people are learning oh halal means this and kosher means that and here's uh, I, what I these options yeah okay. I, I, i'm not sure um and then uh i don't think i caught this but how many schools have community gardens 952. And then is there an option for families to take home fresh produce? Like how does the community garden work? So each site varies. Um, I'd like to, depending on the proximity, some are within the hydroponics are, are nested within classrooms. Some are raised bed outside where the, there's access, where it's open at certain hours and closed on certain hours. Sharing and distributing, um, we'll get back to you in terms of what is available to the community at large. I yeah, I was just curious, given the scope of food insecurity, um, wondering if the community gardens have been an outlet for families to take home um, vegetables um, and or uh, is that something that we can pilot uh, to ensure that families are able to take home food or young people on any given day beyond eating in the schools are able to take home something? Yeah, and as a follow up, that's a great question. I'll make sure I get back to you on process and distribution to be sure. Thank you so much. And I was excited to hear about um, the rooftop access as a potential space for um, gardening. Um, would love to know how many schools, uh, how many school roofs are being utilized uh, for this. I'd say on a top line on rooftops, it's, it's complicated with the multiple means of egress and, and way, things we have to develop, but uh, it's very affordable to do something on ground um, in raised planter blades, that's, that's quick and easy, but I'll definitely get back to you on the number of rooftop installations we have currently. Great, and I'd love the breakdown to be by school district. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Aviles. <coughs> Hello, good afternoon. Um, so I guess I have a, a couple of different kinds of questions. Um, we, we talked a little bit about the hiring halls. I was curious if you could tell us how many vacancies we have and also what are the average wages for these positions? Um, so I would say approximately about 500 vacancies we have across the city right now. That includes school lunch helpers, heavy duty persons, and cooks in the school. Um, and the average wage for a school lunch helper is $17 and change an hour. And has there been any consideration around increasing that wage to attract people that cannot live in New York City on $17 an hour? We work really close with our partners in uh, 372 local DC 37 and are having these conversations currently. In terms of, um, we, we definitely like to continue those conversations clearly with the increasing costs of everything in New York City, particularly housing, and wages that are not increasing nearly that much. This is a serious issue for all of us and we want to retain uh, our New Yorkers uh, with living wage jobs. So um, in, terms of, in terms of the school food contracts, um, I represent District 38 in South Brooklyn and we have a company, the Preferred Meal Systems, uh, also called the Maramont Corporation, uh, which has certainly a history uh, with the city. Uh, we were just informed as of May that the company is closing and their intention is to lay off all 300 employees, most whom live in my district. However, their contract seems to be ending the following year. Do you have any information that you can offer us that we can uh, help our residents? Um, yes, we're aware of the situation with Maramont and Preferred Food. Obviously, that was a national conversation about this as well. Um, we are in the talks and, and working towards making sure there is zero disruption to food service that was coming out of Maramont. I can have more information for you later on, hopefully this month, but we are working to ensure that we will have no disruption to meal service coming out of Maramont. 
Great, I am clearly concerned about disruption of meal service to our students and any other entities that depend on, on that work, but I'm even more concerned about the workers uh, who will just be let go in this economy and have no place to go. Um, also, so I'd love to follow up with you on that. Um, so I'm a long time mom, PTA mom, who ran around pu many public schools. Um, it drove me crazy that there was a practice that um, if a child was served a, a tray of something and they only wanted the apple on the tray, the workers could only give them the full tray. And they would take the apple and they would dump the rest of the food in the trash. Is this still a practice? That's a great question, a question that comes up often. The USDA regulation mandates in order to get reimbursed for a meal, which we're part of the School Food Authority and the USDA, um, we need to serve, uh, excuse me, we need to mandate and serve three components, but we offer up to five components. So three components must be on the tray every single time a student takes a meal, and we then get reimbursed for that. If a student does not take the mandated three components, the city does not get reimbursed for the meal. So is there any way to address that we are just throwing perfectly good food in the trash because we are stuck serving three components that are not gonna be used? So I appreciate that question and actually there's uh, been conversations going on for the past several years and this starting this fall we'll have a small pilot program that we will be able to donate some of this food locally to food pantries. It will start very small, but it's something that we've been working on throughout the pandemic to be able to do this. Um, as a former principal, I also set up share tables within my cafeteria where food can be stored safely and then given out afterwards. It is a practice that we rely on schools to be able to do because we need to make sure the food temperature stays safe or if it's something that doesn't need to be refrigerated is even better. Um, but we are working on that to be able to reduce waste within the schools. Great. We'd, we'd, um, I think given the food insecurity that we see across the city, and this was several years back, uh, it's particularly egregious to watch perfectly good food being tossed in the trash for no reason other than an arbitrary contract by the federal government. Um, so I'd love to work with you more about that. Um, we should be rescuing food 100%. There should be no throwing of perfectly good food into the trash. Um, in terms of Actually, uh, with school gardens, uh, this might be old news, so I wanted to know if this was a still practice. Vegetables that were grown in, in school gardens, um, the students were not allowed to take them home, and in many cases, and this was a couple of years back, so I don't know if this is old news, I'd love for you to verify. Are schools, are children able to now eat those vegetables that are grown and given to their families? I, I think, yeah, Kevin's gonna speak a little bit about it though, but um, I've personally been to schools where I've seen it go home. I've seen- I, I, I know teachers would be like, yeah. take it, but it, yeah. at the time it wasn't allowed. And I just don't know if that was a particular situation or generally there's particular permissions that need to be had around it, so. The harvesting and the distribution of the food underpins that program, so I don't know if there's a place that would be preventing that from happening, but I'll follow up for sure. And if you have a specific example, I'll go right to the school, um, but this is very important to the, to the sustainability of the program itself. Absolutely, great, I'll, f I'll follow up, and it might be, again, old news. And, uh, Chair, just one more quick question. In terms of hydroponic gardens, um, how many hydroponic gardens do we have in, in public schools? And I'd love to know, obviously, I'll, off the record, what that looks like in my district. Let me, I don't know if I have the exact number of the hydroponics, so let me look, but um, if not, I can definitely get it to you. Great. Uh, that's expanding, it's something that's very popular. It's, it's actually affordable and it's easier than raised planter beds uh, and it's within our control, direct control day to day, but I'll get you the accurate number on those labs now. Yeah, and that number was included in the total number of gardens that we gave out before. Great. I think one of the challenges we saw with the gardens was it 100% depended on parent participation, working class communities where parents are working all day. They don't have time to garden. Um, and so we saw the, the very immediate inequity happening in schools across the district where you had available parents having beautiful gardens and schools that did not have that luxury have no gardens and teachers hustling to, to do classwork with children and, and try to introduce gardens as well. So I would love to learn a little bit more about what's the plan to really support uh, gardening and sustainability efforts equitably across the city. Thank you. 
Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Stevens. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I just have, I don't, and I, I'm sorry if this has already been, already been asked, but one of the questions that I have, because especially in black and brown communities, um, a lot of us are lactose intolerant, but milk is the main source of drink for young people, which I do not understand. Um, can we talk about what does that look like for transition? I know at some schools, especially some of the, um, the new ones, they have like water stations and stuff like that, but what are some of the other options? Because I think it's, 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 it's crazy that we're still giving children milk. That's a great question. Um, to be clear, milk is offered with every single meal, not mandated. So students always should have the option of fresh water inside of the cafeteria, either through a water fountain, a bottle filler, or a water jet, which are those water coolers. Our mission is to make sure we get water jets on every single school food cafeteria service line, but if there are brand new water fillers or water fountains in there, we can supplement in there. Um, we are exploring and would love to continue this conversation possibly with the council around funding about what alternatives to milk might look like in the future. Yeah, I think that that's important. We have to start having this conversation because it's, to me, it's, it's crazy. So many children are lactose intolerant. And even to say a, a water fountain, um, if you're eating your lunch, there, there's not cups provided, like those things. So I think that we need to really start thinking about what those options really look like. Um, we have children who drink the milk because they don't have other options and then their stomach is upset for the rest of the day um, and it's never addressed. Um, and even with the cereal, there's always a dairy option. There's no like oat milk or almond milk or anything else offered. Um, and there's huge insecurities with young people. And so we have to be able to give them options and things like that. So I think we definitely need to be looking in to what that looks like to transition that out. Um, another question that I had was around like after school programs. One of the issues that I have been a part of and, and continue to hear issues of if you don't have a minimum of 75 students in your program, you are not able to get hot meals and so you get cold meals. Um, this is something that I, I think we need to start talking about as well. I have programs, especially because of the pandemic, their numbers got decreased or you know students weren't there and so they were only offered cold meals when we know that a lot of times these this is the last meal that a young person might have for the day, and it's it's and sometimes it's just a snack. So, could we talk about what that looks like? About what that transition could look like? How do we address this? Because I think that this is a is a major issue in the communities. You are correct. You need a, a specific number to receive the hot dinner option. Yeah. I'd love to continue this conversation about what it looks like going forward. Obviously, this has a staffing impact. We would need the additional staff to stay afterwards. Snack, the cold snack that you're referencing, really is packed by my employees during the day and then handed out, usually by someone from the after-school program. Hot meals, we require staff to be there, food, sa uh, food safety, temperature, as well as having a food safety handling certificate, which is required anytime hot meals are being served. But I'd love to explore and continue this conversation with you and the council. No, yeah, I think it's just really important, especially because if you go to a community center, they'll have a hot food option. And then if you're in the schools, they have cold food options. And it becomes a real disparity because a lot of our families actually depend on their, their young people to be fed and after school. Um, so I think that that's really important. And I just had a, a follow-up question from um, Council Member Hanif where she was talking about the halal mills. I have a very um, large growing Muslim population in my district and just wondering, what is the selection process looks like for the halal meals, and like, do parents have to, you know, reach out, or like, what does that look like in order to start that process to get those options in schools? It's definitely not a selection process. If a school community and the school administration are interested in having halal meals in their school, all they have to do is make the request. But I just want to echo again what I said before: is that the chancellor requires and really wants to engage stakeholders in the community. So we require the principal to talk to the parent population at the school to make sure this is a choice they want to. To do but I also want to say that the halal options in the schools Sorry, I just have a question sure so why why do we have to have the principal engage parents because other folks don't have to engage parents for, for other food options so shouldn't it just be something where it's like okay this is a request that we should have it because they see a growing population we want to make sure that the school community is on the same page with the requests that they're making because there are some changes that we have to make, including bringing imams into the school, certify the kitchen, and train the staff, and then we receive a certificate from the specific organization that we partner with. We just want to make sure that all parents are aware this is happening in the school, and that is usually messaged by the school administration and the principal. That's why we ask for that partnership to have that done. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Kushner. 
thank you so much, Chair Joseph, for hosting this hearing too. Um, and thank you both for attending as well. Kevin, I think I first want to say thank you for all your work with us early on in the, uh, in the year during the pandemic to get resources to our schools. I uh, really appreciate how responsive uh, you all were. Um, you know, I want to uh, echo some of the things that some of my colleagues have raised. I, this is a really important topic, and I know that the Department of Education is taking more steps um, for um, more healthy, culturally, appropriate, uh, culturally, culturally responsive and appropriate food as well. Um, and, you know, just a, a couple things on those topics. First, I do want to just echo what uh, Councilman De La Rosa had said about really ensuring that our school cafeterias um, are properly ventilated, that our workers um, there are um, able to work through in the summer or in the fall um, in situations where it's not extremely hot. And so that remains a, a, an ongoing concern of ours. And I just want to note that, um, that we'll be monitoring that. My first question uh, is, you know, knowing the, the Meatless Mondays and the Vegan Fridays, as a vegetarian myself, um, raising my children vegetarian too, my wife and I, um, you know, th this is an obviously a, a, an issue of, of personal concern. And I have, while I appreciate the DOE's efforts um, to incorporate vegetarianism and veganism into the diet, the fact of the matter is that still the food that I've seen um, that's served is not healthy vegetarian food. And I think what we want to be showing really is that, and that's the truth of it, is you know, just being vegetarian alone doesn't automatically equate to, to healthy food, right? You have to actually make choices and eat food and that's not processed, um, that's not high in cholesterol and fats, even if there's no, technically no meat on it. And I'm not sure, the DOE, I'm not sure has gotten there yet. And so one question I had was, from given the feedback from, you know, Vegan Fridays or Meatless Mondays too, are there any <clears throat> food consultant or organizations or, diet or you know, dietary consultants or other advocacy groups that you all are working with to figure out what is the best possible meal plan that both reflects uh, healthy food and vegetarianism? It's a great question and great concern. Thank you for that. Um, we actually worked specifically with Wellness in the Schools, the Coalition for Healthy Food, and a lot of vegetarian, vegan organizations around the city to create the menus. Um, the Coalition for Healthy School Food actually works with us religiously, including last week, Friday, at a school not too far from here to create additional vegetarian and vegan plant-powered recipes. So we are going down that path. I would love to go visit a school with you to sure. point out some stuff, take a look at some stuff, and, and educate myself from your perspective, and hopefully you can be educated from my perspective and our perspective as a department about what's included in all of our food, low sodium, low fat, et cetera. But I do want to hear and see the concerns because as you have two kids in the school system Absolutely. that are going to be eating this food, yep. that's what matters the most. Absolutely. And I would appreciate that too because I, I do know there are efforts, but you know, when I hear my child come home and say he's eating you know, pizza you know, or you know, other stuff uh, like that, it's just while the, the philosophy and the policies are there on the ground level, may not always be getting there. So I think, and that's true across the school. So let's, let's absolutely plan to do that and look forward to seeing more efforts from, from the DOE on that regard. And my, my other question is, you know, um, and Councilmember Hanif alluded to this too, but uh, you, you know, we saw that according to the CDC, students in the U.S. receive fewer than eight hours of required nutrition education each school year, far below the 40 to 50 hours that are needed. Obviously, as a parent, this is something that I work on every day at home is also just, you know, ensuring that, you know, uh, my children given all the stigmas and stereotypes about eating vegetables and fruits and things like that, how do we from a young age make sure that children um, feel good, excited, and want to eat you know, healthy and nutritious food? And of course, that's about education. So you know, I just, it, are, are there upcoming programs or what are some thoughts that we can do here in the city to really engage students more around nutrition education? Yeah, very much appreciate. That is quite timely. Um, in the past, we've, we've aligned with our state standards and certainly tracked that schools were, were actually having nutrition and health class um, and giving the hours of instruction manda mandated by the state on all levels. Um, but have this administration has been very purposeful in looking at this topic very closely. We're developing some content now to further enrich. And I think it's, it's more about you know, just the nutritional value but also the culture relevant experience uh, to all and, and how we are shaping our menus now. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna do a much deeper dive into how we supplement our current uh, nutrition and health classes. And so some in physical education, but predominance being in our health education classes. So we're something we're focused on as administration now, the chance to be very clear about how we develop knowledge here and develop content and language that's universal that people understand mm -hmm. to your point earlier about, you know, what is it to be vegan? And there's so much to that, right? And we have to catch up to 
kind of the larger educational experience within classrooms about the experience in the, in the cafeteria. Absolutely. So, and I, and I would just say, you know, in that regard, you know, it's, um, and, and I look forward to seeing more. And, and uh, you know, I think it's, if it's all connected, right? Like, if we want to have better food served in the system that, you know, children will eat and, and get them more used to it too, from a young age, these perspectives develop on food that are much, much harder to undo later. Um, and so, you know, there's some good programs that I've seen in the schools I visited around, um, as mentioned before, whether it's farming techniques or, you know, urban gardens and agriculture. And so, you know, I just wonder if there are ways to link those to education, nutrition, but I think we're really, we've got to be in the business of changing mindsets and, and that's a, you know, much deeper work too with the children. And thank you very much. I, I'd like to, to connect you to our Office of School Wellness if possible as, as we think through this together. Sure. Um, I think it'd be wonderful to have your feedback. Absolutely. All right, Look forward you. to it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member. Um, my question is to piggyback off of um, Council Member Krishna. Um, we know according to CDC students in the U.S. we see fewer hours, fewer than eight hours of nutrition education in schools, far below the 40 to 50 hours that are needed to affect behavior change. So can you tell us how many schools offer nutrition education programs, activities, whether conducted by the school staff alone or in conjunction with organizations? How many CBO providers, organizations work in the schools to deliver food and nutrition education? And how does the DOE track the number of hours instruction students receive? And have you conducted any evaluation of these programs to find out which are the most effective? So top line on uh, all health education that's required, we do track that through our, our systems, the STAR system to actually look at programming. Um, for students in kindergarten through five, uh, they certainly have to have the health instruction every year. The middle school students have to have health education every day uh, in, every, in one semester for 54 hours. High school students, uh, the same. Um, we're looking at building off that. Ultimately, we do have state standards and the city um, can track that very locally through our systems. So um, it's something that we're, you know, I mentioned earlier, trying to expand a bit more of our reach and how, how much we offer this, both in physical education and in health. Are you able to evaluate and assess the ones that are working and the ones that are not working? Uh, on the curriculum side, I'd, I'd, I'd have to get back to our office of teaching and learning and see where the most effective programs that we perceive to be are, are and where we're replicating that, but certainly is one of the pillars to replicating what works best, and so that's a great question and something I'll take back to our, our division of learning, and teaching and learning and our wellness program. Thank you. One of the um, programs I used to run when I was still in school was Cook Shop. Um, is that something you guys are using, or and um, is it something we plan to expand in other schools um, around the nutrition education programs? So Cook Shop is not something that, that we are using agency-wide. Uh, it's something that we've heard of and something certain we'll follow up on to see uh, where it's being used, how it's being used, but it's not managed directly through our department. Um, and I, I'm not aware of schools uh, at large that are using it with great frequency, but something I'll follow up. Um, it's certainly something with the NYC Food Bank that I know uh, works more closely with, so we'll definitely follow up on that item. Yeah, because it doesn't only include the child's um, nutrition education, it also involves the parents right. in teaching them how to cook the food and duplicate the models as well. Um, I'd like to recognize Council Member Sanchez. Thank you for being here. Do you have any questions? No, you're right. Any, round, any other person want to have? Council Member Krishna, you're good. Council Member Dinowitz, you had another question. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I I just wanted to know that the the you mentioned earlier the families are no longer eligible to receive the school food, uh, but they had been during uh, the height of the pandemic. Is that correct? Yes, during the pandemic, we were serving the public meals. Anyone that walked up to a door could receive a meal. When we transitioned into back to student uh, in-person learning, the program for public meals shifted to the city's robust food pantries and other programs that they have. So I, th I, th I think we understand more now than maybe we did five, ten years ago, the importance of things like community schools and schools as community centers as places where children and families go for more than just the 8 o'clock to 2.50 or whatever the school hours are. Are there any efforts centrally to partner with food pantries or trusted organizations that, you know, that we fund in the council, that we work with as council members um, to provide maybe alternative options to the specific school food uh, organizations like, you know, we work with uh, Met Council, we work with Common Pantry and they provide bags of groceries. Is there any effort centrally to, to work with these organizations 
to provide that food to the families outside of the school meals program? Um, at the current time, I'm, I'm not familiar with any conversations that are happening, but as a city, as a department, we would love to participate in those broader conversations for this specific initiative. Okay, and just one other part, you know, we're, we're looking at um, composting, right? We're expanding school composting in the, in the, in the budget. Um, this is a huge issue for this for this council. It's obviously a huge issue for our environment, and a good piece of that is the edu is the education piece and what we're doing in the schools. As part of that program, are the utensils and the plates and the cups and the trays are there efforts being made to ensure that those items, as we expand composting in the schools, that those items are compostable as well? I, I really appreciate you asking that question. For years, all of our trays and cutlery has been compostable. We have not had what you see sometimes, the pictures of the styrofoam, in years. I can get you the exact year if you'd like, but the tray and the cutlery both are compostable. You can, in fact, eat the tray if you wanted to, but I don't suggest that. I, I, I should have known by your smiles that <laughs> when I was asking the question that, that you already had an answer. I that. had to. I couldn't hold I, that in. Sorry. I, I, I just want to clarify, the, the cups as well are compostable? So the cups at the moment are not compostable, but we are in talks to try to get that done as well. Great. Those are my only additional questions. And of course, the other things mentioned earlier that we'll talk offline about about my particular schools and would love to get you to the district. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Council Member. Um, I had a very question. It's very pressing. I'm getting text messages about it. We know that um, the mayor um, had called the elimination of chocolate milk <coughs> from school menus due to high sugar content. So. What is the position of OFNS on this issue? How many students currently choose chocolate milk over plain milk? And how does the DOE, has the DOE done an analysis of the impact of an elimin eliminating chocolate milk from school menus? Currently, we still serve chocolate milk in schools. Um, we are committed to having healthy options in schools for students and will continue to engage all stakeholders in this conversation. Okay, I hope, I hope they heard that because I've been getting a lot of messaging about, about the um, chocolate milk because even the adults drink it. We had another question, I'm not sure, I think Councilmember Stevens asked for it. Students who are lactose intolerant, do we have options for them? So currently water is available and must be available in every single cafeteria, so that is an option. Students that have a medical situation, a 504 or a prescription from a doctor can receive alternatives to milk. We are in talks around what the alternatives are to expand even further, but we're still in talks at this point. Okay, because yeah, that was one of the questions. If there was an um, option for soy milk or option for oat milk or options for almond milk. We have non-dairy milk available for children with a 504 accommodation or a health medication accommodation. And it's on site and the, the, the staff knows to request it if it's available or that's something that's being communicated. It's on site at every single school, and the nur every single nurse in the school has an option for this as well. And we rely heavily on the managers within the school, the cooks in the school, and the principals to know the children and communicate this information to parents. Okay, very important. Um, thank you. Oh, San Council Member Sanchez, please. Thank, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, apologies if, you, if you've covered this since I was in and out listening to the hearing, but um, just in, in comparison to the height of the pandemic, uh, uh, the food programs that the DOE was running in communities, you know, out of schools, the Get Food NYC program, how is that changing as we go into fiscal year 2023? So we are really proud of the work that we did during the pan pandemic, but we are really excited to return this fall to all pre-pandemic regulations and the use of the cafeterias. We will be back to normal service, which is really exciting. Um, we've learned lessons during the pandemic, but I think it's really exciting that we will once again see all cafeteria service lines being used, serving the best food we possibly can, and serving the healthy, nutritious, and delicious meals that we have. Okay, so the emergency provision to community members outside of the school system is, is gonna end? Yeah, um, when we return to in-person learning in September 2021, we transition that work to the city's food pantries and other food distribution sites. That information is on our website as well as the DSS website. Got it. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you around food waste. How do you, how much food waste does um, the federal rule create and how do you collect data on food waste volume from the program? From it's a very good question. 
my staff, they're all trained to do what's called batch cooking. We cook based on the number of meals we serve. We cook based on the attendance at the school, and we monitor this every single day. It is a priority for our staff to make sure they are doing this correctly. This is also recorded in all of our production records and all of our books, which we are audited on, and also allows us to cost out every single meal, including labor. Once a child takes the food away from the service line and discards that, currently we do not track that due to the fact that we would need more staff to be able to do that. Um, it's actually something that we are looking into as we move forward um, with all of the things that we want to do and some of the visions that we do have for our city. Um, but currently we do not track food waste once it's taken away from the cafeteria service line. Okay. Well, thank you both for your testimony today. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch and we'll have follow-up questions. Yeah, and we would love to partner, go to schools, take people on tours. It's something that we really prioritize and want everyone to be able to see the good work that's being done. And I'd just like, once again, just to thank the school food service workers for the great job that they did and also really thank the city and the city council for its partnership. Absolutely. Thank you. I look forward to our partnership. Um, the next we'll have an in-person panel, um, Donald Nesbeth, and from local vice president from local 372 and DC 37, and Julia um, McCarthy from New York Health Foundation. Thank you so much. Good morning, Mr. Netspeth. Welcome. Good morning. Turn on your mic. Thank you. See, I'm so excited to be back in person. <laughs> oh, okay. That's excitement. Uh, Please. So, good morning, uh, distinguished members of the council and education committee chair, um, Rita Joseph. Um, I'm Donald Netspeth, vice president uh, for DC 37, local 372. Uh, we represent the members who work in school cafeterias, and prior to being elected, I'm proud to say that my title is a school lunch helper slash cook. So I come from out of the school food, um, school food area of the school building. Um, I'm here representing 24,000 members of my local, 9,000 who work in the school food um, section of the school under the leadership of President Sean D. Francois I. On a normal day, children need food in order to concentrate and learn in the classroom. Local 372 is extremely supportive of the breakfast program as well as the universal lunch program. Every child that comes into a school building should be fed and nourished. However, this is demanding work. While current practices meet the Department of Education, off the Office of School Food Standards, the current guidelines spread school food employees thin. Between the breakfast and the classroom program, um, and preparing for lunch in a short period of time. On top of their core responsibilities, these workers serve tens of millions of meals during the pandemic um, to families, uh, to the community, as outlined here today. Um, and um, so they need more than a clap. Um, they need uh, true recognition. Uh, furthermore, well-intentioned um, lawmakers introduced legislation uh, for example, intro 199 um, that, require, that would require letter grades um, for sanitary inspection. Um, this bill uh, doesn't include um, that the Department of Health report would um, document areas of the school building that are not necessarily kitchen areas and will lead to further um, disciplinary or ways to disciplinary um, action against the workers. Um, the strain in the workforce 
must be alleviated uh, by hiring more school food, uh, more lo local 370 school to um, school food staff. Respectfully, re um, we request um, a thousand additional workers um, to alleviate the burden on the workers who are already um, overworked uh, due to workers leaving, um, due to the mandates or whatever has, has happened during the pandemic, more workers have uh, retired uh, than, than usual. Another struggle faced by school food employees, which has a direct impact to sanitation and hygiene, is the need for our cafeterias and kitchens to have uh, ventilation, proper ventilation, ACs, I mean, cooling areas. Uh, most buildings uh, that are built between 1930 and 1990 lack, lack that proper design. Um, in these kitchens, many, many, thank you, Chair. Uh, many of these local 372 kitchen employees every day have little to no cooling or ventilation, um, and temperatures can reach over 130 degrees in some cafeterias. Working under these high conditions, high temperatures are dangerous. It can lead to workers passing out, experiencing heat stroke. Heat stroke is the most serious um, illness associated with, with work in hot environments. Workers can suffer um, heat strokes become delirious, confused, um, convulsive, and comatose in some cases, and even fatal. We must do something to correct this um, and uh, be proactive, not reactive to the situation. The city controller issued a report on this, and in previous city council hearings, um, council member uh, Traeger um, even pushed, and he's, he's here, um, even pushed uh, for, for the need for us to do something immediately because as a teacher he saw the effects of um, kitchen um, workers um, who experienced overheated kitchens uh, various times. So resolution, um, it moved him to introduce resolution 145-2019 uh, 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 calling on the Department of Education to install air conditions and cooling system in New York City public kitchens. In addition to ve ventilation, uh, Local 372 supports the redesign um, of cafeterias, which focus, focuses on increased numbers and student participation. Providing healthy food options has been a push by the mayor and a priority. Uh, we're in support, but we will reiterate um, that you need educational components uh, to go with this. While implementing this policy is a good step, um, in pr but providing education on healthy eating habits should be a focus to help our children be mindful of healthy eating habits um, and healthier choices. Children will be more inclined to eat healthier options if they knew what foods are beneficial uh, to them, especially in younger children. For example, if you tell a child that eating carrots is good for their vision and for their eyes, they'll be more inclined and likely to eat carrots uh, compared to children who are unaware of its benefits. So in conclusion, school food workers are critical to a functioning school system. These workers come in every day, go above and beyond, sometimes come in uh, before their time, leave later without being compensated. Uh, the city's children are their life's work, and in order for uh, this program to succeed, uh, we need adequate staffing, a safe working um, environment, and nutrition education. And lastly, I'll end with this. This is something that should be all of our priorities because children in our society are 20 to 25% of our population, but they are 100% of our future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, yes, you're right. They deserve more than a clap. They, they were the heroes during the pandemic. I was still teaching prior to getting into the council, so I saw it firsthand what they did. Incredible work, and I thank them. But we owe them more than that. So what is it that um, we were, I think one of my colleagues asked um, that living wages be one of the things that the employees are offered and safe working conditions. And um, one of the things I know um, Kevin talked about is installing ACs so the workers can cook and nutrition education. Well, we thank you for your service. Um, what is it that um, you talked about the intro 191. What is the problem with that intro? So that bill doesn't take into account that when the Department of Health actually comes into a school, the Department of Health does an extensive report, but it's not only the kitchen that they do a report on. They also go into areas like the custodian 
um, cleaning areas like the slop sink, which is not inside of the physical kitchen, but it physically goes into a report. Um, that report is then issued to the supervisory uh, or managerial staff at School Food. And if there's a grade system, it will only reflect on the staff of the kitchen. Um, and it will also lead to, it adds another layer of disciplinary action against workers. Like we said, there were heroes and sheroes for us, adding another layer of discipline uh, and some of the report doesn't even reflect the areas, I think is just unfair. Okay, thank you for that, I, I needed to know that. Um, what is the starting salary for someone who works at OFNS? So school food employees, um, when they come into a job, uh, it's 14 um, something an hour uh, for a senior school lunch helper and a school lunch helper. Um, that increases um, over a two year period and then they go to the incumbent rate and as Kevin indicated earlier, um, it, it's on an average of about $17 an hour. So, and you, you are saying that that's not living wages for your members? No. There is certainly a need to increase. If you look at, um, you do a comparison of school food, um, of food employees um, in um, hotels and other places, um, they are certainly making salaries uh, beyond our salaries. Uh, you look at some of the, um, our kitchen, um, Kitchen employees uh, do work um, on a level of sous chefs um, and chefs, um, and we, we know the type of money that they're making, um, and, and this, this is their life work. Um, this was my life work. Uh, being a cook, I took into consideration that um, if I wouldn't eat it like this, I wasn't going to cook it for my students. Um, even in my visits going back to the school now, uh, most, I've been an officer for seven years um, on the union side, but I go back to the school and just coming from that community where I worked at, um, so many students who older brothers and sisters went to the school have heard about my food and say, hey, when you're coming back, right, to cook for us now um, in our generation. Um, and so many stories of this nature um, and the impact that we have uh, within the schools um, again, it should be more than a clap. Uh, we really need to start looking at the work that they're actually doing and do a comparison of what a chef is doing um, and how much they are actually getting paid. We've also been uh, making a push with the leadership in, in um, the Office of School and Nutrition um, to actually consider our cooks for those chef positions. When the city is looking at chef positions to train um, the cooks, we should give first priority as we are the ones that are actually doing those jobs on a daily basis. I hope Chris is taking notes. Is that one of the reason why um, it's been hard to staff um, school? It, it has been one of the reasons. Uh, some, some individuals who have gone through the hiring halls, and I, I do have to give credit where it's due. Um, Chris and I, we had a discussion on um, the need to hire um, more and, and, relieve, and put, create some relief are for the workers that are currently there. Um, and so this push has been both from the union and from management side to create hiring halls, create spaces where we will get more people the job. Uh, but what we're finding is people get the job. Um, a few of them have said, I can't live on this. And that within the first couple of days, they may leave the job, right, to go somewhere else. Um, even if the job doesn't include um, the, the health benefits and things that you get attached to a city job, people are just leaving because the money, they need to be able to survive. Got it, understood. Well, thank you for that. Um, my next, Julia, how are you? Thank you. Chairperson Joseph and distinguished members of the Committee on Education, my name is Julia McCarthy and I'm a senior program officer with the New York Health Foundation. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I want to take a quick moment to answer three questions that were raised earlier. First, to uh, Council Member Dinowitz, um, we are, will be releasing survey data that polled families with children later this summer and fall on their perspectives around school food, and I look forward to sharing that with the Council. Um, second, on um, questions that Brewer, Lewis, and Council Members Brewer, Lewis, and Lee raised, um, we are also supporting the Mayor's Office of Fo Food Policy to implement the Good Food Purchasing Program. Um, that was required through Executive Order 8, and that will open up, hopefully, contracts to more diverse local vendors. And then third, um, directed to council members Joseph and Krishnan, 
um, thank you for funding the Food Ed Hub. Um, the, that's at the Tisch Food Center. They actually aggregate sort of all information on nutrition education and are tracking that and working with the 80 plus groups across the city um, who provide that. So I'd say they're a great resource to answer any further questions. Now turning towards uh, my testimony, um, supporting healthier culturally responsive food is a core strategy of the foundation, particularly in schools. In 2017, we supported community food advocates to secure universal free school meals in, for New York City's 1.1 million public school children. And we are also now supporting an advocacy campaign at the state level that would expand free school meals for all students building on New York City's successes. Both the Office of Food and Nutrition Service and the New York City Council can take actions to prevent childhood hunger going forward. So looking first at the actions that the Office of Food and Nutrition Service can take. We applaud their continued focus on the role that school meals play in maintaining students' health. And I wanna say, as a backdrop, New York City school food um, is like New York as a whole. You know, we are sort of setting the pace for the rest of the country and we are still always recognizing that we need to strive for more and can do better. Um, you know, despite OFNS's heroic daily efforts, there are looming federal policy changes that will create barriers to flexible school meal access. And we recommend that the Office of Food and Nutrition Service, in collaboration with the Mayor's Office of Food Policy, develop a plan for future school closures that's informed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Focus groups conducted by the Tisch Food Center provide insight onto how OFNS can continue to improve. And I wanna be clear again, these are actions that OFNS has been taking and been working with partners to continue to improve on, but should be considered seriously in this plan. That is first, to continue to offer flexible pickup times and expand the number and location of those pickup sites and make sure that they are in welcoming locations. DOE can also strengthen communication about food availability, providing information in multiple languages and communicating changes in real time. They can increase the variety of meals offered, um, including hot meals and those that are culturally relevant. And finally, ensure consistent impl implementation across sites, especially in less wealthy neighborhoods. Turning quickly to what the city council can do. First, I would say continue to provide additional funding. I agree with what my colleague here has said that local funding could both help it mitigate the impact of higher food prices and really help OFNS hire additional school food staff. Chris said that they're nearly back to pre-pandemic levels, but those levels were too low. We know that additional school food staff and school food managers would help um, them to better serve school communities. Next, we want to advocate for school, we want the city council to advocate for school meal waivers to be made permanent at the federal level. So federal, th these federal waivers made meal provision during the pandemic easier and research from the Tisch Food Center again suggests that these measures, if made permanent, would increase participation. And finally, we want to support efforts like the push for universal school meals at the state level. So we know, you know that the, these federal waivers may not come through past June 30th, and the state still has an opportunity to act, and one that would provide economies of scale across the state, including to New York City. And New York City Council members can voice their support for free school meals for all statewide, should the federal government choose not to act. New York Health Foundation is grateful for the shared recognition of the important role school meals play in promoting food security and dietary health, and we look forward to continuing to partner with the city. Thank you so much both for your testimonies. Um, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Felice. Do you have any questions, Councilmember? Okay, thank you. Thank you both for your testimony. Anyone else in the room needs to testify? We're gonna now move to our Zoom um, testimonies. Hi, Heidi, with Heidi Zachariah. Time, time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. My name is Sharia Ohid and I am currently in seventh grade at Iceland. Yes, this is a group of students that are testifying on school food today. Thank you, Ms. Zachariah. where I participated in a semester-long academic project with the Generation Seven earlier this school year. It is important when the New York City Council hears about our issue because it's a serious issue that needs to be addressed and students like us deserve to have a voice. 
It is also important because by default, you will be the first school in your in it will be the first school in District 24 that reports high level PhD. There are actually 43 schools all over New York City that already report high level PhD, most of them including me. It is not it's not fair that all not all schools are high level PhD welcome. If so many schools and students are still high level PhD. I am Rosa Dahan and welcome to a part of the Rehab Spotlight. It's where there's issues that impact us within our community and develop consensus around one topic to address collectively. After much debate, we decided to focus on... We cannot hear you. After much debate, we decided to focus on halal food and set a goal to implement halal food into our cafeteria. I'm testifying today on behalf of a Muslim student... Can you turn, off your, turn up your microphone and speak up a little louder? I'm a Muslim student who cannot eat current lunch food at my school, and I want to vouch for the other students that share the same situation. Our class chose this issue because we had have become apparent that a lot of food waste has been accumulated due to the lack of halal food, and Muslim students can't eat the food served. The alternative foods in school lunches are, aren't as nutritious as the main meal. Seven to ten hours of school where Muslim students to go without eating nutritious food, not only is this unhealthy, this affects their education as they are far less productive. It's important that we accommodate those who make up a majority of our community. Although this doesn't accommodate everybody, it's a big step in the direction of helping people within different needs. Halal food doesn't always mean samosas and biryani. It's having meat, slaughtered, and prepared in different ways. Some examples of foods are noodles, ravioli, falafel, and different types of rice. Okay. If we, if we can't fully apply this request, I think it's important to include more nutritious options for Muslim students. To complete this goal, we made a letter and sent it to their principal and dietitian. In this letter, we talked about how at least 20% of the school population is Muslim. In our school, I have five, and that's at least 500 uh, Muslim students. And it would be really helpful um, because the school days are 7 to 10 hours long, and it would make them more productive. Less food also go to, would go to waste because more students would want to eat that food. At this point, 40% uh, of the school food gets thrown out in our school, and less food would get thrown out if we implemented raw food. So even though it may cost more, uh, less meat would go to waste. And I think that at least uh, 372, uh, $372 dollars worth of food from each person is wasted uh, every year, and 387 billion calories of food are wasted. And means that less would go to, go to waste if we implemented raw food. And after that, that letter that we sent to the dietitian and principal, we made a survey to the school. And with the survey, we talked about how, how many students in the school are Muslim, would they like halal food implemented into the school lunch, and how many would like normal lunch. 10% of NYC is Muslim, which is about 800,000 students. And a lot of the schools in the other schools are allowed to eat Muslim food. So I think it would be important if we also implement the halal food in our school. Thank you for the opportunity to submit this testimony about an issue that's important to me and my classmates. My name is Kashri and I'm from class 742. My name is Mushki Khan from class I'm sorry, can you speak up and put the mic, turn it up? School food of higher quality. This is because me and some of my classmates, we did some research with our peers, and we found out that most of the students who don't really like the school food or enjoy eating it, it's just that they have no other options to eat. And I think this is concerning to a lot of people because if, if you're not giving good food, how are 
could talk. And another thing is that the quality of the food is really bad. We did m more research with other peers, and we found out that our beans are like wet. They're different colors. They we have brown broccoli that had no food. Our chicken is had these full of uncooked. We need the students to, to speak up, and maybe because there's two accounts, two um, online, that would help if it turned one of them off. Thank you. Um, having halal food would kind of um, increase, the, increase um, the amount of people that are eating our school lunch, and it's also it also has many benefits. Some benefits of halal food are less waste of money because more students will be eating um, the food. Also, um, halal food has better ta is better tasting because of the way it's prepared and the way the animal is, the way the animal is, um, th like the conditions that the animal has within its life. Um, when preparing halal food, you have to kill it and you have to slaughter it in a specific way that um, is the most humane way, which is also better for the animal. Um, and this causes the food to taste better. It makes the food more tender and it also makes it more nutrition, nutritious because um, it, like, it's, the halal food is also like bacteria resistant because of the lack of blood. So this not only, it doesn't only um, benefit Muslim students, it also benefits all students who are eating halal food. Um, it also benefits um, Jewish students who have to eat kosher food because um, within like the requirements, halal food also meets kosher requirements. So it kind of benefits all students. Hi, we can't hear you. Um, is it possible that you cannot use the headphones? We can't hear you. And, um, uh, I, agree I don't think so. Hello? Hey, can I hear much better quality. Uh, halal food is expensive because there's a lack of companies that sell halal food. Now that there's an uh, international pandemic, there's also an um, insufficient amount of halal meat that should be distributed to independent shops and groceries. Another reason why halal meat is expensive is because the animals must be slaughtered in a very specific way. The animal that is slaughtered must also be taken care of properly. Other than these reasons, there are any reasons not to distribute halal meat to all animals. Dahan again, and my class discussed issues that impacted us within our community and built consensus around one topic that to address collectively. After much debate, we decided to focus on halal food and set a goal to implement halal food into our cafeteria. I'm testifying today on behalf of our goal because I am a Muslim student who cannot eat the camp lunch food from my school, and I want to vouch for the other students that share the same, same situation. Our class chose this issue because the amount of food waste has been accumulated due to the lack of halal food. And Muslim students can't eat the food served. The alternative foods in school just aren't as nutritious as the main meal. Seven to ten hours of school seven to ten hours of school where Muslim students have to go without eating lunch is not only unhealthy but also affects their education as they are far less productive. It's also important that we accommodate those who make up a majority of our community. Although this doesn't accommodate everybody, it's a big step in the direction of helping people with different needs. 
Hello to just my Aviv Miriam Simosa from Biryani, which just having the meat slaughtered and prepared in a different way. Some examples of these foods are noodles, ravioli, uh, falafel, and other types of rice. If you can't fully apply this request, I just recommend to include more nutritious options for Muslim students. continue on without any more speakers from ISO 25. Okay, we will move on to the next panel. The next panel will be Rachel Sabella from No Kid Hungry, Amy Hamlin, Coalition for Healthy School Food, Kelly Wind, Coalition for Healthy School Food, Allie Miller, Edible Schoolyards, and Liz Ackles, Community Food Advocates. Start with Rachel Sabella. Your three minutes oh. start now. Before, before we move to public testimony, testing my audio. Audio sounds good. Can I go? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Rachel Sabella. I'm the director of No Kid Hungry New York with Share Our Strength. Um, I want to start my testimony with, testimony with saying I've been advocating on food insecurity on school meal programs for the last eight years, and I've never been a part of a hearing quite like this before. I want to thank Chair Joseph for leading and making this hearing happen. I've been cheering and tweeting along, and we especially appreciate your remarks 
tied to breakfast in the classroom and the federal nutrition waivers. I also want to express my deep appreciation to Speaker Adams for highlighting school meal programs, the waiver programs as part of her state of the city. The council is a leading and longtime voice for these programs, and we're grateful for the work that you've done and will continue to do to connect more kids and families with meals. I'm going to send my testimony written to everyone, but I really want to highlight two key things right now and themes that we heard throughout the pandemic. Food insecurity. One in four kids in New York City could face hunger since the start of the pandemic. We saw progress reversed, but we saw the DOE jump in action, the entire team at the Office of Food and Nutrition Services, and especially the men and women of Local 372, DC 37, that have been on the front line since day one. Whether giving out community meals, making sure our breakfast in the classroom, and we hear you, Chair Joseph, and we support you on this, was implemented in every single school building, even ones that said they couldn't do it for the previous years. We wanna see that progress made permanent, and we wanna make sure that the Department of Education is making sure every school fully implements grab and go breakfast, delivery to the classroom, making sure kids have that regular and equal access to meals. The other point I wanna make that's really important today and is the most time sensitive is we heard in Chair Joseph's questions about the expiration of the child nutrition waivers. We still have a chance to get these waivers extended, but only if everyone in New York City takes actions now. From Mayor Adams to Chancellor Banks to Speaker Adams and the entire city council, we need you to raise your voices to Senator Schumer, to Senator Gillibrand, to members of the congressional delegation, several of whom used to serve on this body, and make sure they know that these waiver extensions are going to be extremely important to feed more kids in New York City. Parents can no longer pick up meals for their children. Kids have to eat on site with somebody watching to follow those federal rules. And we heard Chris say that they're looking at a 15% reduction in federal reimbursements because of this expiration of waivers. We can fix this, but we need Congress to take action now. So we look forward to working with this council. I look forward to meeting with everybody, passing on our testimony and being supports to you and the Department of Education as we continue to support the one in four children in New York City that face hunger. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Amy Hamlin, followed, followed by Kelly Wind. Time, time starts now. Hi, this is Kelly Wind. I am um, testifying for Amy Hamlin, um, and uh, both of us work for the Coalition for Healthy School Food. Uh, we are a nonprofit that introduces plant-based foods and nutrition education in schools to educate the whole school community about the health, environmental, and social justice issues of our food choices. We have worked in partnership with the New York City Office of Food and Nutrition Services since 2005. We are the nonprofit organization that helped to implement Plant Powered Fridays. We are also working with OFNS to, to develop additional plant-based recipes. We work with Title I schools since 2005, providing a variety of resources and services, including our Food on Earth curriculum, guest speakers, family dinner nights, teacher professional development, cooking classes, a, vis a visiting vegan chefs program for culinary high schools and virtual programming. We are grateful that OFNS kept communities fed during the pandemic. We are impressed with the partnership meetings which provide transparency about what they are doing as well as an opportunity for all of the partners to learn about each other's work. Of great interest to us at the coalition is the increased attention to plant-based main dishes. The major cause of death and disability in the US is the food we eat. High blood pressure and high cholesterol are reversible in a matter of weeks. Heart disease and type 2 diabetes is reversible in a matter of months, as Mayor Adams did. Raising animals for food is one of the top causes of climate change, and reducing or eliminating meat and dairy is the biggest thing that in, an individual can do to address climate change. But we also want to point out that research from the British Medical Journal shows that vegans have a 73% lower risk of developing moderate to severe complications of COVID-19. So anything we can do to move toward a more plant-based diet helps strengthen our immune system. The coalition is here to continue to provide services to schools and work in partnership with OFNS. 
we request a focus on three budget priorities. One, provide funding to nonprofits to provide research-based nutrition education in schools. Most schools do not have the budgets to pay for our services. And yet our comprehensive education for students, their families, teachers, and other school staff creates real change in each school community, promoting the food available in school cafeterias, as well as the nutrition, environmental, and equity issues related to food choices. With funds from city council, we could teach more and fundraise less. Two, provide funds to enable schools to provide non-dairy milks upon request. Most students of the global majority cannot digest cow's milk. This is a serious equity issue. Lactose intolerance is actually a normal condition. Mammals are not meant to drink milk after weaning, nor are they meant to drink the milk of another species. What this means is that students of color may end up with a bellyache or worse as a result of drinking cow's milk. Time expired. Three, support OFNS by providing funding for 60 additional managers so that they can achieve optimal, optimal staffing levels, helping ensure that children are well-fed and ready to learn. While not a budget item, item, we also want to mention that the procurement process for new foods is very cumbersome. New suppliers can register, but bids are not frequent, and innovation is slow due to the process. This means that it can take two to three years to get a new food on the menu. While we understand the need for competitive bidding, this really impacts the ability of OFNS to add healthy new items to the menus. We are grateful to the City Council for its commitment to supporting healthy food in schools. Thank you. Next up is Allie Miller, followed by Liz Ackles. The time starts now. Hi, everyone. My name is Allie Miller from Edible Schoolyard NYC. Um, I'm going to start just by saying thank you to Chair Rita Joseph and all the distinguished members of the Education Committee for holding this hearing and giving us this opportunity to submit testimony. Edible Schoolyard NYC partners with New York City Public Schools to cultivate healthy students, school environments through hands-on cooking and gardening education, as well as supporting school cafeterias and healthy school food. We're currently working with 10 schools serving 3,500 students in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Bronx, where we are maintaining caring for school gardens, knowing that teachers and school staff often do not have time or pay to maintain school gardens. We're leading student, family, and community programs, and we're providing healthy plant-forward food distributions. We know that schools are critical spaces for students to both receive and learn about food. And for many New York City students, the bulk of their food and nutrition is coming from schools. We believe that school food needs to be nutritious, locally grown, culturally appropriate, and student driven. And we believe deeply that school food is most successful when paired with food education. Uh, because of this, we have several recommendations, including more in our written testimony. Um, one, providing sustained, flexible funding for schools, knowing again that school staff are often overworked, underpaid, um, and often schools lack resources to bring in community-based organization partners to care for school gardens, to provide food education, to provide cafeteria-based education, and to support with cafeteria composting. We also support expansion of cafeteria-based nutrition education, such as OFNS's Garden to Cafe program, um, which is very limited right now. Our staff right now are actually at this moment at PS 109 in Council District 14 in the Bronx, uh, working with the Garden to Cafe program to serve spinach carrot salad with a honey thyme shallot dressing and local New York State apples to students in the cafeteria. It's been reported that the students are really loving it, and we know that students who get to taste what is on the menu beforehand and get to see how it relates to their school environment, their school garden, they will enjoy that food more. Uh, we also uh, support providing opportunities for more student-driven school food menu items, giving students voice in what is on their menu, especially making sure that that food is culturally relevant, will support more students to eat choose and enjoy that food. We also support asks to increase the capacity of OFNS through more school food managers and better retention of school food workers, um, as well as uh, planning for increased accessibility and community feedback in planning for summer and emergency school food. Thank you so much to the committee for all of your time and your efforts. Thank you. Uh, next up is Liz Ackles, followed by Debbie Lee Cohen, Roma Yang, and then Philip Chong. Liz. 
Time starts now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Joseph and members of the committee. I'm so happy to be here today. It is refreshing to have a mayor and city council that are focused holistically on students' school meal experience. Um, so this has been a long time coming and it's, it's really just fantastic. I want to acknowledge all the work that the leadership in OFNS and everyone throughout the process have been doing for years, but, but um, really bringing innovation to, um, to children's experience in, in the last uh, while. I am here on behalf of Community Food Advocates and the Lunch for Learning Coalition, and we are the coalition that fought to get universal free school meals for all New York City public school students and have recently, in the last few years, turned our efforts to making sure the Department of Education's uh, cafeteria enhancement experience, which I call cafeteria redesign, is scaled to all high schools and middle schools. I'm so happy to hear so many people talking, uh, both council members and, um, and other folks testifying. Uh, we're here for two reasons. One is, first of all, to celebrate the $50 million that was included in the city budget to expand cafeteria enhancement experience to another 100 schools, which will will serve many, many thousands of children. Once those schools, all the funds that we currently have and those new funds are rolled out, we'll have about a third of the high schools and middle schools covered under cafeteria enhancement. And as you know, anyone who knows us knows that we, we're focused and persistent and we keep our eyes on the prize. And our ultimate goal is to ensure that all students all high school and middle school students have an enhanced cafeteria. So we'll be working, looking to you and looking to the administration to work together to ensure that as we move forward, we will make sure that that, that is something that's applied equitably across all schools. I just wanna take one more minute to say, there's a lot that we learned uh, from the pandemic and echoing both Chris Tricarico and Rachel, breakfast in the classroom and breakfast after the bell, by necessity, was scaled across the whole, the whole school system. We know that breakfast in the classroom and for older students, grab and go meals in schools are essential and totally complementary to the enhanced cafeterias, doing everything to make sure we're getting meals to kids in ways that are um, enjoyable, accessible, and also in terms of that, we need to make sure there's proper staffing to make sure all those things can be carried out. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Liz. Uh, next up is Debbie Lee Cohen, followed by Roma Yang and Philip Chong. Debbie? Time thank you. Now. Thank you, Chair Joseph and committee members, and also big thank you to all the council members previously who asked excellent questions. I'm Debbie Lee Cohen. I'm the executive director and founder of Cafeteria Culture, the environmental education organization. I'm also co-director producer of the award-winning movie Microplastic Madness that stars Brooklyn's uh, PS15 fifth grade students. I'm a parent and educator and a stage four cancer patient who's deeply concerned about environmental and health impacts of our school cafeteria garbage, especially plastics. Um, cafeteria Culture was founded as Styrofoam Out of Schools. We work with youth to creatively achieve zero waste, climate smart school communities in a plastic free biosphere. We teach innovative environmental education, foster youth led solutions with citizen science, civic action, film production, and the arts. And we partner with school food directors and students. And through that partnership, we catalyze the elimination of styrofoam trays from all New York City schools and now 18 school districts across the country. We're ready now to catalyze the elimination of the remaining single-use plastics from New York City school cafeterias, revive, refill, and reuse models, and pilot new methods to dramatically reduce wasted food. Um, 
I just want to say that I'm testifying today in part to highlight the positive incomes, I'm sorry, positive outcomes of our 13-year partnership with OFNS, including our most recent collaboration on the first citywide plastic-free lunch day. Um, I want to urge the council to increase financial support for small nonprofits and community-based organizations like Cafeteria Culture that are leading low-cost, cutting-edge pilots that accelerate urgently needed institutional change and benefit our students at the same time. Um, thank you for the funding for New York City Council funding over the years already for our um, organization, Cafeteria Culture. On May 16th, um, 2022, Cafeteria Culture, in partnership with OFNS, Office of Sustainability, students, school staff, led the first New York City Plastic Free Lunch Day. Over 750 New York City elementary schools had school lunch prepared without plastic on this day, providing a glimpse of what a plastic-free school cafeteria future could look like and that it's possible. All schools were encouraged to join in the action. Um, and I encourage you to watch our short video. If you go to plasticfreelunch.org, uh, you can see our video right there that we made in a uh, partnership with OFNS and sustainability. And I do want to also um, give a shout out to Chris and to Stephen O'Brien and all the directors of OFNS who supported this initiative. It, you know, was, it was a bit of a lift um, during this time and we waited for two years for it to happen. This was a student suggested initiative um, at PS15, where the initiative first started in uh, the students who first led this in 2018, um, we did a waste audits again with students there and the number of plastic items from Time school expired. lunch on May we reduced 72% of the plastic items or two pieces of plastic for meal per meal. So imagine that over an entire school year with 100 meals served, a million meals served per day. We have a great opportunity to put a big dent in our procurement of plastics while we save money. And to quote Scarlett, a fifth grade student at our partner school, PS 188, the Island School in Lower Manhattan, maybe we could make plastic free lunch day one day, then make it a week, then make it months and then years, and then make plastic free lunch day every day. Um, I just want to highlight here that um, these school pilots are, are benefiting students on multiple levels, that this kind of collaboration and in-classroom education and opportunities for students to actually take action can be a really incredible antidote for climate anxiety for our students. And the negative and health consequences of our city's plastic procurement cannot be understated. Reducing the production, use, and disposable disposal of plastic advances our climate, our city's climate goals. Thank you. I'll be testifying at the sanitation hearing as well. Right now, I'm going to that hearing. And I thank you again for this great hearing and this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Debbie. And next up is Roma Yang, followed by Philip Chong. Time starts now. Good afternoon to all panelists and council members. My name is Roma Yang, and I am here on behalf of Union Square Academy for Health Sciences. But I'm also here as a student myself to speak on the food we consume every day in school. Most of New York City school meals are usually provided at no cost because of the amount of low-income families residing in all five boroughs. I personally remember paying for lunch only once ever in my life, and that was back in elementary school. Um, the only honest opinion or review you can really get is from the student who has consumed these school meals on a daily basis. Many students rely on school meals being their important meals of the day, which is why making sure school meals should be filling and as nutritious as possible. When I was asked what changes we'd like to see in NYC schools in the future, I mentioned school lunches. There are a large number of students in many schools, and it's understandable that it's hard to prepare hot lunches for a massive group of students. However, so far, the school lunches I've had over the years have not been as, feel, as filling and as they should be, nor are they super nutritious. Recently, they've also gotten rid of the salad options, which I found very unnecessary. See this change in nutritious school lunches, that's so appetizing, sooner than later would be phenomenal. Thank you, Roma. Next up is Philip Chong, and the following panel will be Aideen De La Cruz, followed by Jenny Valadares, David Ross Edelman, Eloisa Trinidad, and Tom Buckley. Next up, Philip Chong. Time starts now. 
Thank you, Chair uh, Joseph and community members and council members. My name is Philip Chong, Executive Director at Quincy Asia Resource Group, a not-for-profit uh, organization mission to foster and improve the social, cultural, and economic and civic lives of immigrants and their families in order to benefit all communities. Uh, we always collaborate with uh, different resources and organization and partnership to provide culturally competent services, uh, such as workforce development, multilingual uh, family and elder services, food security programs, adult education, and such. Uh, we also a nonprofit um, to help support the Get Food program as an anchor Pan Asian meal provider. Uh, we help mobilize the local immigrants' own restaurant as a food provider and then tap into the touring sector to providing delivering uh, network workforce to support the 127 million meals delivery uh, to the homebound elders during the pandemic. Uh, today, I want to share the initiatives that we have recently launched uh, in partnership with Montefiore Hospital uh, uh, for a public school in the Bronx, PS199, the program called Pathway to Healthy Adulthood. As a father of two daughters, um, they also rely on uh, lunch. Uh, no matter how much we pack at home, uh, they never really, they never really eat it. They always go to the cafeteria with the friends. And we know that there's many factors when uh, when they deciding what and uh, what they want to eat. And many times coming home, they always complain about how much they don't like the food. And we know that uh, this, whatever they eat, whatever they learn and choices for food is will stem in terms of how they grow, uh, how they grow up as adulthood. So uh, it's very important for this program, uh, this program pathway to health healthy adulthood, we call it PHA, is a collaboration between Quincy Asian Resources and Montefiore uh, school health program is to educate and empower youth and their family members to become uh, stewards of their health while fostering the healthier school and community environments. The goal of the PHA is to bring culturally sensitive fresh produce and nutritional education to high need schools in the Bronx. Um, and what, what we know that is the New York, uh, New York City Hunters Bureau. Uh, the PHA we launched as a pilot at PS199 in the South Bronx in April 20, uh, 2022. We plan to expand uh, the program to total six schools every year in the Bronx um, starting in September. Um, the, the challenges that we face, uh, as I said earlier, Hungry's Bureau in the New York City, uh, one of the four residents experienced food insecurity and ranked 62, uh, 62nd out of New York's 62 counties in health outcomes. As a resident of the nation's poorest urban county, approximately 40% of expired. children live below the poverty level. So for this program, we have three uh, major focus, food access, nutrition, education, and social services. Uh, we provide fourth and fifth grade, uh, the program called Choose Health and Food Fun and Fitness Curriculum developed by Cornell University. We also, every two weeks, provide fresh produce boxes with eight to 10 items variety to 300 uh, students and their family members at 199, at PS199. And on top of it, uh, with our multilingual uh, social service uh, outreach coordinator, we provide uh, different services, including SNAP application, food assistance program, adult education workforce. Uh, we hope to expand this program definitely. This program is in the partnership of Montefiore Hospital, Stop and Shop, City Harvest, and also the support from the EGL Foundation. Um, it's thank you for the opportunity to let me speak to the committee and thank you so much for supporting this, uh, the whole overarching in terms of improving health and uh, food access to our students. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Next up is Aideen De La Cruz, followed by Jenny Valadares, David Ross Edelman, Eloisa Trinidad, and Tom Buckley. Aideen. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Pearson Joseph, and to everyone. My name is Aideen Dela Cruz, and I am a senior physical therapist in the New York City Department of Education for 16 years. I'm also the vice chair for PTs for the PT OT chapter in the UFT, and one of the founding leaders of the grassroots group, OTs and PTs for a Fair Contract. 
1975, President Ford signed into law the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, also known as the IDEA. The law guarantees access to a free uh, access to a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment to every child with a disability. So many things have happened since for our students with special needs. The DOE has offered a smaller class setting appropriate for these students when necessary. They're also offered physical, occupational, speech, vision, and hearing therapies, as well as counseling as mandated in their IEPs. They have been offered school buses to and from school, use of elevators in order to access their school environment, testing accommodations, access to special education teachers, paraprofessionals, adaptive equipment, adaptive PE teachers, nurses, and so much more. However, one thing that has been bothering me for years is that the New York City Department of Education has, uh, has failed to provide one very vital thing to our most vulnerable students to thrive in our schools. In 1946, the school lunch program was made official when President Truman signed the National School Lunch Act. This act ensures all students all over the United States a balanced meal while in the school. This act is supposed to cover all students, but it sadly does not cover special education students who are on a special diet due to sensory and or medical issues like being fed through a D2, uh, G2, have weaknesses in their oral mandibular muscles, making chewing difficult for them, have issues with swallowing and more. I have personally seen students starve during the school day because they cannot eat the food offered in the cafeteria. I have seen students who at 1 p.m. would sleep in the classroom because their bodies have shut down from not having fuel throughout the day. Some lucky students have parents and guardians who would make sure that they have an appropriate packed lunch or snacks to eat in the school. But alas, I have also witnessed a lot of students whose parents and guardians, for whatever reason, fail to send food for these kids. School staff can only do so much in reminding parents and guardians to send food for their kids to have, who have special dietary needs. Now I implore you all to not forget the small population of special education students who are in need of special diets as you talk about budgets. Maybe there's a way you can place in their IEPs what kind of food should be given to these individuals during the school day as directed by their medical providers. And maybe there's a way the DOE can supply these. All students deserve a balanced meal and all means that the special education students are included in that. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in behalf of our special education students. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Jenny Valadares, followed by David Ross Edelman. Um, good afternoon. I'm Jenny Valadares. I go to Union Square Academy for Health Sciences. Food provided to us by the New York City Department of Education is important to me, and I believe it's something involved in students' everyday life. By providing nutritious meals, schools play a crucial role in creating lifetime healthy eating habits. I've been served stale waffles during breakfast and barely cooked chicken nuggets and fries. During the pandemic, students were served ham and cheese sandwiches and peanut butter sandwiches, which as a student who's eaten them before, know that they're not able to keep me energized throughout the school day. Um, school lunches meet the high nutritional standards for a student to consume, but there are other ways our school food can be nutritious and yet tasty to eat. Changing our school foods would be a huge improvement because not only will students be able to enjoy their meal, but they will be able to focus during their classes and go seven to eight hours energized and full of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Next up is David Ross Edelman followed by Eloisa Trinidad. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Eloisa Trinidad. Sorry. My name is Eloisa Trinidad and I am the executive director at Chili Sun Wheels. In New York, thank you to Chairperson Rita C. Joseph, as well as the members of the New York City Council Committee on Education for holding today's oversight hearing and the opportunity to submit this testimony. Chili on Wheels works to make healthy food accessible to communities in need. We do this through direct food relief, nutrition, education in schools, mentorship, and policy work to address the ongoing vulnerabilities and injustices of the food system. During the pandemic, we expanded our services to include home grocery delivery to students and their families, as well as plant-based community fridges to 
serve students 24 seven. We also set up fresh organic produce distribution and grocery distribution at DOE sites in Brownsville and the South Bronx. We served and continue to serve thousands of food insecure individuals across New York City that sought out our program during the pandemic. 95% of the people and students who request our services are not vegan, but have dietary restrictions or simply want better tasting food that is healthy or ingredients to cook from scratch. We're incredibly grateful for all the improvements in schools that OFNS has done in expanding culturally relevant and plant-based meals. However, dietary restrictions and cultural relevancy do not disappear during an emergency, a pandemic, during the summer, or during part of the week. Therefore, those requiring plant-based meals should have options every day and they must be culturally relevant, which explains the success of plantings in schools. To address food insecurity, we must meet the needs of everyone, especially those with dietary restrictions at those as those populations have more challenging of a time accessing meals when food insecure. Fully plant-based meals um, as daily options should extend beyond hummus and pretzels and peanut butter and jelly as these are snacks and not adequate meals. Cultural relevant plant-based meals meet the requirements of those practicing Hinduism, Rastafarianism, Jainism, Buddhism, Seventh-day Adventist, veganism, as those philosophies and religions require animal-free diets. And in many cases, they can also meet the needs of those practicing Islam and Judaism with proper certification. The pl Black population is also the fastest growing demographic in the U.S. to practice veganism. And much of our youth is passionate about climate change and animal welfare. All students should have a choice beyond traditional cultural relevance and feel empowered and supported in deciding what they want to eat. This is an equity issue. In addition, according to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, adequate dietary fiber intake is associated with better digestive health and reduced risk for heart disease, stroke, hypertension, and certain gastrointestinal disorders, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and certain cancers. However, national consumptions indicate that only about 5% of the population, which includes children, meet these requirements and are not, getting inadequate, are not getting adequate fiber intake. Therefore, providing adequate and culturally relevant plant-based meals daily as an option and in emergencies can potentially increase our students' fiber intake, setting them up for a healthy and prosperous future. Meals should not Time only be plant-based, they should be culturally relevant. As far as milk, about 75% of the global population cannot digest lactose after infancy. This percentage increases in BIPOC populations and it is not a disability. Specific populations of color with high levels of lactase deficiency include about 95% of Asians, eight, about 80% of African Americans, and up to 100% of Native Americans, and about 80% of Hispanics, according to the National Institutes of Health. In addition, about to 80% of Ashkenazi Jews are also lactose intolerant. New York City schools are not required to provide a student with a non-dairy substitute unless a parent submits a note from a physician or a caretaker. The requirement for a physician's note creates a financial and administrative burden for parents and disproportionately affects students of color. The cost of a physician visit, visit and the lost time from work from a parent is a necessary hurdle that pre prevents students from receiving appropriate nutrition at school. Students should be able to freely choose nutritious I'm drinks quiet. that that will not make them sick throughout the day. Lactose intolerance is not a disability. The inability to digest lactose is a specific genetic trait like being left-handed and happens in most places around the world. Therefore, parents, students, and school need more flexibility to ensure the student meal program serves nutritious meals to all participants. In conclusion, we would like to see dietary restrictions addressed more intentionally, plant-based options become more culturally relevant, and provided daily with plant-based milk options to all students so everyone can have equal access to nutritious meals. We would also like to see more intentional nutrition and health education so the culture around food can shift towards a healthier and more sustainable one. We urge the council to fund our school system as well as our community-based organizations to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Tom Buckley. Time starts now. Thank you, Ms. Chairwoman and Education Committee members. I know your meeting is focused on the important topic of school food, but I would like to share my thoughts about school safety because without it, there would be no kids at school to eat school food. Your meeting was the first one I could join since Uvalde. Thank you for this opportunity. 
I'm G. Buckley, a 10-year-old New York City resident, and I'm speaking because we have to help stop gun violence in schools. One way we can do this is by installing locking doors. If we installed locking doors in schools, we could trap intruders long enough for the police to get there in time and take over the scene. Another way we can make schools a safer environment for kids is by adding one or two more security guards in every school. This would be tougher for this would be tougher for intruders to get inside the school, and these security guards should be armed with a taser at all times when on duty. Arming our teachers would not help. One more way we can make schools safer is by adding scanners at entrance doors, not just scanners in a fourth or a half of schools. We need scanners in all schools. It does not matter if the school is Catholic, private, all boys, all girls, or public or co-ed. We need scanners at the entrance doors of all schools. I made the poster you see on the screen about two days after the Uvalde shooting. At our local park, dozens of kids and some adults signed it. I told some of the kids that I would speak to lawmakers, and they asked if the lawmakers could speak with them. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That's all of the panels we have signed up. If we have inadvertently left anyone up who would like to testify, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of the Zoom chat and we will call on you. Seeing none, that's all the witnesses we have today. I would like to thank everyone who testified today. Um, thank you and see you at the next hearing.